Mr Yes. Commissioner, today we will hear evidence from Mr William Malcolm in respect of the final case study to be heard today, and that concerns credit card limit increases by Westpac. Uh, Mr Sheen will adduce the witness statement and summons. Thank you. Mr Sheen. Mr Commissioner, um, might I apologise immediately for the late correction to his statements. It was a correction of substance. I wanted to emphasise that um, there's no reflection on Mr Malcolm that that error occurred. He relied on information. We checked it before his statement went on and double checked it after his statement went on in the course of this week and it was then that the error was discovered. But we apologise for that. Thank you for the apology. The last minute nature of the change always presents difficulties, Mr Sheehan. That's the reason I mention it, uh, not as some idle crit critical commentary, but to try to avoid the difficulty. But thank you for the apology. Thank you, sir. Um, I call um, William David Malcolm. Mr Malcolm. Uh, Mr Malcolm, would you prefer to take an oath or to make an affirmation? Nice. Yes, swear the witness then, please. I swear by Almighty God. I swear by Almighty God. That the evidence I shall give. That the evidence I shall give. Will be the truth. Will be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Do sit down, Mr Malcolm. Yes, Mr Chair. Yes, no, thank you. Um, your, your full name is William David Malcolm? Yes. But you're known as David? Yes. And your residential, uh, your business address is 283 to 285 Kent Street in Sydney? Correct. And your current position, Mr Malcolm? I'm General Manager Credit. For Westpac Banking Westpac Corporation? Westpac Banking Corporation. Thank you. Now, uh, for this commission, you have uh, signed two statements. Yes, I have. Uh, the first is dated the 19th of March 2018 and the second the 21st of March. That's correct. And you're attending here today pursuant to a summons. Yes, I am. You have the summons in front of you. Yes. I tender the summons dated the 8th of March 2018, Commissioner. Exhibit 1.163 will be summons to William David Malcolm. Now, in relation to your first statement, Mr Malcolm, um, you you have um, indicated you need to correct paragraph 60B. That's correct. All right. now, um, and, and the substance of your second statement is the correction to that paragraph. That's correct. Commissioner, would you like him to strike out paragraph 60B in the first statement so there's no... It's probably the most efficient way, isn't it? I think so. Uh, Mr Sheehan, if you'd be good enough to delete the relevant paragraph and initial the deletion, Mr Malcolm. Yes. Uh, with that correction, Mr Malcolm, are its contents true and correct? Yes, they are. I tender it, sir. That'll be Exhibit 1.164. Statement of William David Malcolm, 19 March 2018. And for the record, the doc ID is WIT.0001.0014.0001. Thank you. And the, um, your second statement, Mr Malcolm, uh, is dated the 21st of March 2018? Yes, it is. And uh, do you have any corrections to that statement? No. No. Um, are its contents true and correct? Yes, they are. Uh, I tender it, sir. Exhibit 1.165 will be further statement of William David Malcolm, dated 21 March 18, with the doc ID... WBC.900.001.0161.0016. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Mr. Yes. <coughs> Mr. Malcolm, you said you were the general manager of credit at Westpac. You've held that position since June 2015, is that correct? That's correct. And you've been employed at Westpac since 1988? Yes, that's correct. You were the Chief Risk Officer of Westpac, or Australian Banking, sorry, for Westpac from November 2010 to March 2013, is that correct? That's correct. You were also a member of the Executive Leadership Team for the Westpac Financial Services Division from 2010 to 2013, is that correct? Um, for the for the uh, Australian Financial Services Division, but before that it was product and operations and the consumer banking too. Yes, thank you. You have been put forward by Westpac today as its witness 
for this Royal Commission on issues connected with credit card limit increases offered by Westpac during the period between September 2012 and December 2014. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. And that is the relevant period that you deal with in your witness statement? That's correct. And you are familiar with the events that took place in that period, Mr Malcolm? I am. I just want to talk a bit about the credit cards that are on offer by Westpac, which you also discuss in your statement. Uh, Westpac offers 25 different credit cards at present, is that correct? Uh, yes, I believe that's what I have in my statement, yes. yes. And some of these are offered under the Westpac brand, but others are offered under other brand names, is that correct? That's correct. Uh, can you tell us those other brand names, Mr Malcolm? Um, the St George Group, um, Bank of Melbourne, Bank SA. And there are also credit cards, 62 I think you mentioned in your statement, that are in circulation, but they're no longer offered as products, is That's that correct? correct, yes. And at page four of your statement, you set out the total balance outstanding for all credit cards. I think we'll bring that up if that's possible. Uh, there it is. The, the screen next to you is probably the, I hope, the easiest and best, Mr Malcolm. Thank you. Uh, so that shows that as at January 2018, total balance of all credit card products issued by Westpac uh, is, is over $9 billion. Is that correct, Mr Malcolm? Actually, um, it's actually around $10 billion. Ten. Okay, my maths is not, not as accurate, but around 10 And does that figure include balances for cards issued by other brands or under other brand names? That's, St George, etc. That's all the brand names, yes. All the brand names, thank you. And does it include, it doesn't include balances written off by Westpac? No. No. And credit cards are offered to customers through branches and Westpac's websites, is that correct? Um, um, yes, through branches, online, um, and through uh, call centres, and also through affiliate sites um, and um, directly to staff. And calls through the call centres that Westpac operates? Yes. yes. Uh, what about through letters and, and mail outs, that, that kind of material? Uh, no, not to, not, uh, not to mm -hmm. um, new customers. And at page three of your statement, that's triple zero three of that document that's on the screen. Thank you. Uh, you refer to three different types of customer. Uh, and you refer to the terms transactors and revolvers. And are they terms commonly used in the banking industry, Mr Malcolm? Yes, they are. And so transactors are the customers who pay their full balance in t on time each month, so they don't pay any interests or late fees. That's correct? That's correct. And revolvers are the people that, that don't pay off their balance each month, so they would pay interest. Is that correct? That's correct. Yes. And there you say in your statement there that they generally use credit cards for short-term finance to meet short-term cash flow needs. Yes. And sometimes will they pay late fees too, Mr Malcolm? If they, if they pay late, they'll pay late fees, yes. yes. And would you agree that revolvers are the most profitable customer for the bank? Um, yes, they probably are. And it's also the case that they're likely to pay more interest over time because they won't reduce their balance. Uh, well, they do reduce their balance, but, um, but they, do pay, they do pay interest. By definition, transactors are paying off each month, so they don't, don't pay interest. But we earn other revenue from transactors. Oh, sorry, revolvers. And what about revolvers, Mr Malcolm? Yes, they, yes. Pay, they pay interest when they, when they revolve. Uh, Westpac has made a number of submissions in response to letters from the Commission which mention the issues that you deal with your witness statement. I'll, I'll take you to those, I'm not sure if you've seen them, but the first one is dated 29 January 2018 and that is DOC ID RCD 0001 0029 0003. Have you seen this document before, Mr Malcolm? I have seen it in the course of preparation. Yes. At page Sorry, zero... in the course of preparation to give evidence or in the course of preparation of the document? Oh, to give evidence. Yes, Sorry. thank you. At 0114... Oh, 0014, apologies. You see the heading credit cards and 
under the heading Bank Initiated Credit Card Limit Increases. As a reference there, I'll, I'll read briefly. In September 2012, ASIC raised concerns with the Australian Bankers Association, ABA, and other industry associations regarding different credit limit increase practices and expressed the view that responsible lending obligations required banks to consider, among other things, the current income and employment status of prospective recipients of credit increases. Through an industry survey in January 2014 and notices issued from August 2014 onwards, ASIC sought and Westpac provided information and documents regarding its credit limit increase processes. Westpac informed ASIC that in its view, its process has satisfied its responsible lending obligations. ASIC raised specific issues with Westpac about its, res its automated responsible lending processes in use from 2012 to 2014 and suggested that they may not have been adequately taking income and employment factors into account. Approximately 6,600 accounts were affected by this automated approval process. In December 2014, Westpac temporarily suspended credit limit increase invitations until it had implemented changes to its processes. Customer initiated credit limit increase applications continued to operate. Throughout 2015, Westpac engaged with ASIC about resolving its concerns in a way which would remediate any affected customers now facing financial difficulty. And those are the matters that are dealt with in your statement. Is that correct, Mr Malcolm? That's correct. Uh, Westpac has also provided another submission to the Commission which lists uh, events of misconduct that have been engaged in over the last five years. I will take you to that. The document ID is RCD 0001-0029-0114. And the relevant pinpoint is 0118. Oh, apologies, Mr Malcolm. Have you seen this sort of document before in your preparation of your evidence? Um, yes, I believe I have seen this, yes. And you can see there, there's an item number 26, which refers to the incident that we just discussed in the earlier response. Yes. So th this listing here, uh, would you agree, is an acknowledgement by Westpac that its conduct in relation to the credit card limit increases that you discuss in your witness statement was misconduct? Yes, we've defined it as, as, an, as, an, as an issue of interest, so... And I should clarify by misconduct there, I mean within the terms of reference of the Commission. Right. Uh, I want to go over some things in your statement before we turn to a chronology of the events that led to Westpac remediating Before customers. you do, Ms Diaz, should we... Uh, tender. Tender first. Uh, as Exhibit 1.165, Westpac response to uh, dated 29 January 18 RCD treble zero one double zero two nine treble zero three at double zero one four paragraph capital B credit cards I think is the title is that the portion of it yes uh, we only need that page Commissioner thank you Yes, that'll be Exhibit 1.166. Help me make it count. Uh, and Exhibit 1.167 would be the further submission of Westpac, uh, Item 26, uh, RCD 0001 0029 0114 at uh, 0118. Thank you. Is that right? That's correct, Commissioner. Thank you. Uh, if we could go back to your statement, Mr Malcolm. At page 13, if you have it there, and the doc ID is wit.0001.0014.0013. You say in the period from September 2012 to December 2014, 
Westpac sent 1.16 million letters to customers inviting them to take up a, credit, a, a limit increase on their credit card. Uh, and of those letters, 217, uh, 169,000 customers responded to the letter offer and were granted credit limit increases by Westpac. Is that correct? Uh, yes, that's correct. Uh, and you're aware that from 1 July 2012, uh, banks, including Westpac, were prohibited from sending unsolicited invitations or offers to customers without their consent? That's correct. Uh, and you say in your statement that Westpac had the consent of 1.16 million customers who received their offers? Yes, that's correct. Uh, how did Westpac attain consent at the time? Um, it was previous to this period um, where we would have obtained consent either through the online banking system or by contacting customers um, and obtaining their consent. And what were the forms of contact? I'm sorry, I don't, I don't know exactly what they were. Uh, tick boxes on letters such as please consent to or I consent to receiving these offers? I, sorry, I don't remember exactly what it was, but they were, they were, uh, they were in a form that was um, acceptable from a legal and compliance perspective and they were sent and accepted. And does Westpac do its best to send out as many offers as it can? Well, if you yes. know enough to tell me it was all uh, uh, compliant, uh, I think... Sorry, I right. should say it went through a compliance process and was signed off for compliance before... Somebody that decided it was compliant. Yes. Yes. I, is it unduly cynical to think that at least some of these consents would be constituted by a failure to uncheck a pre-populated checked box on a website? Um, no, it was an opt-in process. It was opt-in? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, if someone tells Westpac that they don't want to receive marketing material, does that mean they won't receive the sorts of offers that we'll be discussing today? Um, yes, that they're, that it's, it, it depends on what type of things that they've requested, but yes, the, if they're on the do not call register or do not market register, um, they would normally be excluded, but if we've got a, a, a consent to receive um, customers for dealing with their own customers, and um, there, there, there were offers sent to customers on that list if they had consented to receiving them. And when did you start, uh, when did Westpac start asking customers for consent? I don't recall the exact date. And so you would, would you agree that an increase offer is marketing material? It's, it's partly marketing, yes, and it's partly cust customer servicing. So they're existing customers um, and we're offering them a, an additional service. Uh, I want to take you to an email which is from 2011. It's WBC 099-001-0356. Uh, this is an email from May 2011. Apologies for the small type, Mr Malcolm. Uh, this is before that prohibition that I referred to came into effect. Now, the, the names have been redacted, or the email addresses, apologies, have been redacted, but you can see it's an email uh, from Rob Love, Head of Financial Crime Management and Unsecured Risk Product and Operations. And he is forwarding an email to someone. Uh, I, now, I'm not sure if you have a copy of this, Mr Malcolm, but it is you that is being the recipient of this email, but your email address has been redacted. Uh, and below we can see what Mr Love is forwarding is an email in relation to um, credit cards and initiatives. It says, in addition to the attachment below, the following life cycle initiative is also underway. CLI months between offer for non-responders to be decreased from six to four months, subject to approval. Uh, now, CLI months there, is that uh, credit limit increase the gaps in the offers being made to customers? Yes, that refers to the frequency with which offers are being made for non-responders. And those are the people that don't, don't respond to the first offer, so they get uh, targeted with another request uh, within four months? Uh, potentially, if they've 
pass the eligibility other eligibility criteria. On the second occasion. Yes. yes. Well, on both occasions. And uh, four, item four, CLI offers to go to the no marketing group, greater than 300,000 customers, will now qualify for offers as we have finally gained agreement that CLI letters are account management letters rather than marketing offers, a common sense decision. Now, is that still the approach taken to these sorts of offers? I'm, I'm not sure and I don't, I'm, I, that's a, it's an email, I don't know whether that decision is was actually ever implemented. You received the email. Did, do you not know what happened after that? No. Do you know what happens now? I'm, I'm not aware of, of, of whether, they, whether we market to the no marketing group, but there was obviously a discussion of that at the time. This email itself is not, it's not conclusive, that that was actually approved. I'm asking you if you know if it was approved. I don't know. Uh, and the next uh, item, number five, the NCCP FCA, brackets further credit assessment group of CLI offers, 30% of offers that are currently being excluded from offers will be reintroduced from August. This will provide a significant uplift as this is the more credit active group. Uh, now, there's a few things that we need to unpack there, but further credit assessment group, you refer to them in your statement, and we'll come to that. Uh, that's the category of people that were asked for further information when they were sent their offers, but there was also a group that wasn't asked for further information. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Uh, so this is saying that, that that group, the further credit assessment group, uh, will get 30% of the proportion of offers sent out. And yes. that's still the case, isn't it? Yes, or that's... During the relevant period. During the relevant period, yes. Uh, and the final item there, seven, proposal to be developed regarding increasing exception fees for repeat offenders. E.g. keep it at $9 for first time delinquency, I'm, I'm reading there, I interpolate. But if twice in three months, then make it a higher dollar value. Product are pushing this one. Uh, who is product there, Mr Malcolm? Do you know who that refers to? Uh, well, the, the product management team within Westpac. And product being the credit card team? In, in this case, yes, but product includes other products as well. Thank you. I'll tend to that email, please, Commissioner. Exhibit 1.168 will be email from Love to Malcolm, 27 May uh, 2011, WBC 099-001-035556. <coughs> uh, Mr Malcolm, I want to take you to some of the letters that were sent to customers between September 2012 and December 2014. I'll take you to an exhibit that's in your statement. Uh, it's WBC 104002003, and that's the eighth exhibit, WDM 8, Mr Malcolm. Thank you. Uh, so the people that received this letter, Mr Malcolm, they are customers that Westpac considered no further credit assessment was required. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Uh, and this sort of letter made up the majority of the invitations sent in the relevant period. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Uh, and a cohort of these customers ended up being the subject of the remediation program. That's correct. Uh, in your statement, this group of customers is, is referred to as the no further credit assessment category. That's the no FCA category. And we'll, we'll d discuss it a bit later as well. That's correct. Yeah, that's correct. Uh, so when the customer receives this letter, they won't be asked for further financial information? No, um, they, they weren't. Um. Thank you. Uh, now, this customer is being asked, uh, well, sent an invitation to increase their credit limit from 3,700 to as much as 6,000. Uh, they're, they're told, simply choose how much you'd like to increase your limit by, up to 6,000, then apply online or complete the form below. Now, and the form below has that tick box and they, they can fill out that smaller amount there, but they can also opt to have the increase to $6,000. Um, now, on the back of that 
that letter, Mr Malcolm, maybe we can put them side by side, so 0004. Thank you. There's, some, there's a title there, important information. Uh, Westpac's lending policies and guidelines are designed to ensure we lend responsibly. Before applying to increase your credit limit, please make sure you're comfortable with the higher monthly, repayment, monthly payments apologies, and higher credit limit. If your circumstances have recently changed or are likely to change, or you think you won't, wouldn't be able to afford the increased payments, you shouldn't apply for a credit limit increase. To manage your credit card, just remember these two simple rules. One, always aim to pay off more than your monthly minimum amount, as making minimum payments is not an effective way to manage your credit card debt. Now, the customer that receives this letter, as we said, isn't asked to provide any current financial information about themselves. They're not asked to tell Westpac about their income or debts, is that correct? That's right. And if they ticked the box that we saw before and sent it back, they would be approved for their credit card limit increase? That's right. They've, they signed, signed the letter. Yes. Thank you. Uh, now, you're aware that the National Credit Act prohibited at this time, and still does, uh, Westpac from entering into a credit contract with a customer without dirty, doing certain things first, and that would include increasing the limit on a credit contract. Yes, that's right. Uh, I'll take you to some of those provisions, Mr Malcolm. Just uh, before we leave this yes. document, uh, direct your attention to the second page that we respect your privacy uh, part of it. Do you see that? Yes, I do. Uh, do those two sentences that next follow support a view that what was suggested in the email in uh, 2011 was in fact implemented, namely that withdrawal from marketing was not treated as withdrawal from receipt of credit limit increases? Well, they're, they're treated separately, aren't they? They're treated separately, that's right. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, to go on. Uh, RCD 0022 0001 0001. Thank you. And that's the pin point. Oh, that's the first page. Mr. Markham, so that's the National Credit Act. And then 0098 <coughs> and 99. If we could put those side by side. Thank you. Thank you. So we can see there, Mr. Malcolm, uh, the obligation under section 128. Uh, the licensee, and that would include Westpac, must not enter a credit contract with a consumer who will be debtor under the contract, uh, and B, subsection B, increase the credit limit of a contra credit contract with a consumer who is the debtor under the contract, unless, and then further down, they have made the assessment and made the inquiries and verification in accordance with section 130, and then over the page we see that the reasonable inquiries that must be made under section 130, and those include inquiries about requirements and objectives in relation to the credit contract, uh, the consumer's financial situation, uh, taking reasonable steps to verify the consumer's financial situation, uh, and steps required by the regulations. And you're familiar with those obligations, Mr Malcolm? Yes, I am. Uh, in your statement, you describe in detail how Westpac identified customers who were eligible to be sent an offer, uh, and this was an automated process of identifying those customers. Is that correct? Yes, it was. And it used, I call it data analytics. Is that a correct term for that process? It used all data that we had on those customers. They were existing customers, so we had a num uh, data from a number of different sources. Uh, it, but it wasn't a process that was undertaken by asking customers for information and then verifying that information at the time of the offer? No, it wasn't. Uh, now, the modelling program is quite complicated, but I want to focus on the first step, uh, and that's the step by which the customers are split into those two groups that we talked about, the, the group of customers that require the further credit assessment, or the FCA, uh, and the second group that don't require that assessment. Uh, and they're, they're the group 
that sometimes we see described as no FCA. Uh, now, the way that Westpac determined the split is based on the usage of the card and the ratio of the payments to the balance. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Uh, now, in your statement, you set this out. We'll bring that up. A WIT 0001014007. Thank you. Uh, so, at paragraph 28, you explain this this categorisation and these two things. You explain that the utilisation ratio is a measurement of the customer's credit card utilisation expressed as a percentage based on the average of their last three statements. And the payment balance ratio is a measurement uh, of the customer's payments compared to their credit card balance. So in the brackets it says there, for example, if a customer had an outstanding, average outstanding balance of $50, at the end of each statement period and repaid on average $25 of that balance, their payment balance ratio would be 50%. Uh, and these were used to determine whether Westpac thought the customer could service a higher minimum repayment amount. Is that correct? Um, it, it wasn't a full serviceability assessment. The only purpose of this step of the process was to categorise the customer into where we needed further credit information or where we believed that no further credit information was required. Uh, well, we'll go further down to paragraph 29, Mr Malcolm. Uh, so that's where you, you've said that it's used to calculate the theoretical maximum, uh, where serviceability meant that the customer would be able to repay the minimum repayment amount of 2% plus a buffer of 0.5%, so the total being 2.5% of the outstanding balance per month, assuming that 100% of the total credit limit was utilised. Uh, now, would you agree that that's quite a low th serviceability threshold? Um, it, again, just to sort of reiterate, the purpose of this was only to determine whether or not we needed to, to get further credit information. So what that calculation would do would be put onto a plot um, and where the customer was very comfortably able to service a higher limit, they would go into the non-further <coughs> um, credit information category. Um, but a, a, so, so it, it only classified customers into whether or not further credit information was required. But was the dividing line as described here or was there some other dividing line? In my statement, um, Commissioner, I have the, the tables which are, which are used to, to decide whether or not a customer was further credit assessment required. But in your statement, Mr Malcolm, at paragraph 27, which is just a bit further up on that page, you say categorising a customer as FCA was effectively a determination that Westpac required additional information before it could be satisfied that the CLI was not unsuitable. Uh, now, does that not involve a conclusion that if a customer was classified as non-FCA, that Westpac had determined that it didn't require additional information in order to conclude that the CLI was not unsuitable? It, it only takes it to that stage of the process. The process for whether or not a customer is eligible for a CLI also involves the next two stages of the process, which is the application of 36 exclusion rules and then more detailed analysis about um, whether a customer would be eligible for a CLI. So this is only one stage of the process. But the other stages don't involve a calculation of serviceability. This is the stage where you're trying to determine whether the customer can afford the increase. Is that right? It, it, does, it does have a, a serviceability calculation within this and it, it has a presumption within that that they're, if they're making actual payments to their account against the, the, the balance of their account, so we know exactly what amount that they're paying, which is well in excess of the minimum, then that would mean that they could service the higher limit, yes. And you've told customers we saw in that letter earlier that um, they should pay more than the minimum. Yes, really. they should. Um, but it's, is it not inconsistent for Westpac to assess suitability here, which you refer to, uh, 
by reference to this minimum repayment and a buffer of only 0.5 per cent, having told customers that they should really be paying a lot more than that? Yes. It, what, we're, what we're assessing there is their ability to, to service their payment obligation and um, without substantial hardship, um, which is the, the requirement. Um, uh, so that's, that's the assessment that we did based on the actual payments they were making to their account after paying out all of their other expenses. And how long, how far back do you look at the actual repayments? What's the minimum period that you need to take into account for this program to uh, pop out a figure at the end? The, the, the percentage was based on the, the last four months of payments. So only four months? Yes. The average so of the four last payments, four months. essentially? Yes. Sorry, and it was an average of four months? That's right. So one big payment in month number one uh, may be enough to tip you over into the average? It's the average amount repaid compared to the actual balance over the last four months. So it's, it's how much are they paying as a percentage of their, their ba balance each month. Yes. Thank you. Uh, and you'd be aware that there have been legislative reforms that are going to take effect uh, from 1 January to require uh, banks to take into account not just that minimum repayment anymore, but the entire limit over a certain reasonable period of time. Are you aware of those changes coming up? Yes, I'm aware of it. Uh, and will this, this process be changed to implement those reforms? Um, it, it, the other part of the, the reforms are that bank-initiated CLI offers will no longer be allowed, so it makes the process. Okay. So this, this whole program will be defunct from that, I see. We'll still need to do customer-initiated credit limit increases, but, um, but, but not bank-initiated. Thank you. Uh, so, <coughs> returning to your statement, we, we mentioned that you say that if a customer was categorised as FCA, that's effectively a determination that Westpac required additional information to be satisfied of that unsuitability under the Act. Um, but if they were categorised as non-FCA, there would be no additional information required, and we saw that the letter didn't request additional information. That's correct? That's correct. Okay. And you say in your statement that uh, 840,000 offers were made to the no FCA customers during the relevant period, is that correct? This is at pa paragraph 73, Mr Malcolm, sorry. Thank you. Yes, 840,000 offer letters. And 183,143 were approved as a result of that letter that we saw before. Yes, 183 increases as a result of the customer responding to the letter. Yep. Okay. Uh, now, in your statement, you also set out the types of information that Westpac had access to before it decided to send out those letters. Uh, and you mentioned that before, data. Uh, so data about their credit card account and the transactions. Uh, now, would the data come from other Westpac accounts as well that they would have? Uh, yes, we would use data from all of their relationship with Westpac. Uh, but if the customer had only one account, say just the credit card account, that's all the information Westpac would have to put into this automated process, is that correct? Yes, we would have their transaction data on their credit card and other demographic data that they would have um, supplied on origination of, of the credit card. Uh, but the customer could have accounts with other banks and other liabilities that, that Westpac just isn't aware of, is that correct? Yes. And the, this automated process couldn't take into account those non-Westpac commitments, if I could call it those? Uh, no, not for the, the non-FCA customers. Uh, and, and in terms of income, if a Westpac customer only had a credit card account, Westpac wouldn't have information about their income other than what perhaps was given in the initial credit card application. Is that correct? That's, that's correct. Okay. So, Mr Malcolm, do you agree that Westpac's reliance on this automated process adopted for certain customers would not have been adequate to ensure that Westpac could take into account the financial situation of the customer in making that assessment that we discussed under the Act? In other words, um, 
it didn't involve taking reasonable steps to inquire about the customer's financial situation when the offer is made. Well, we were of the view at the time that the, the totality of what we did in, for these existing customers constituted reasonable inquiries um, based on the data that we held on that customer um, for the size of the limit increase that, that we were providing. So it was proportionate to the additional commitment they were making on, uh, that they were taking on, um, and the actual payments they were making to the account. So we thought that was reasonable for the size of the additional commitment that they were taking on. But they weren't asked about their income or their debts, is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Um, now, Westpac conducted a remediation for customers who received that no FCA letter that we looked at. Uh, now, you give an example of a customer who had their credit card limit increased from 1,800 to 3,500. And we'll, we'll take uh, you to that. It's WIT 001 0014 0017. And this is uh, page 17, Mr. Malcolm. And it's, it's uh, under question 14A. So uh, this customer was contacted as part of the remediation and uh, Westpac found out that they were on social security at the time that the credit limit increase was approved. Is that correct? Um, during the remediation pro process, the customer informed Westpac that he'd been unemployed um, at the time of the CLI. Yes. And further below, uh, he was co contacted in May 2016 and he said that as a result of injury, he was unemployed at the time the CLI was granted, had been receiving social security payments and estimated that his income had fallen by almost 50%. Uh, now you've agreed that Westpac didn't make financial inquiries for people like this customer. Uh, do you agree that Westpac didn't take reasonable steps to verify his situation? At the time, at the time, at of, the the time of the CLI. Um, again, one of the rules that we had in the second stage of the process, the exclusion rules, was that we would check our systems for whether the customer had informed us that they were unemployed. And also we did a check of their transaction accounts to see if they were making, they were receiving social security payments. Now, in this case, um, they may have been receiving those social security payments to another account that we didn't have access to. So in this case, that, that exclusion rule didn't, obviously didn't trigger. Um, so um, we, we proceeded with the, with the CLI. Would, the many obligation would many customers tell Westpac when they became unemployed? Uh, yes, we do find out. They'll, if, they ring, if they become unemployed, they, they um, ring our Westpac assist team and um, ask for assistance. If they're looking for assistance, they will tell yes. uh, why they're looking for assistance. But short of asking for assistance, would a customer ring up and say to Westpac, I just thought I'd better tell you I'm now unemployed? Not, not as a matter of course, but, but if, thought they, so. if they couldn't afford their repayments to their credit card, then... It's, it's when they hit the wall or hit a hurdle that they will then come to the bank saying, I've got a problem. Yes. Yes, I understand that. Um, but it's further, the further test that we do is that we actually check their accounts to see if they are in receipt of, of, of social security payments. So there is a step that we take, but I agree with you, for customers that don't have their transaction account with us, that's not going to be an effective trigger. And the Act requires Westpac to make these inquiries, not the customer to tell Westpac. You would agree with that? Yes. Okay. And you say... We could multiply the colourful examples, couldn't we, Mr Malcolm? Uh, the credit card customer who uh, has a child, the child is seriously ill, etc. The, the colourful examples could be multiplied many times, couldn't they? Yes, they could. Yeah. And none of them uh, would have been uh, automatically detected uh, by the processes that the bank had in place. Again, it's it's making reasonable inquiries is 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 the test that we we we're assessing ourselves against. And if a customer is having difficulty, but they're making actual payments to their account in excess of the minimum payment, such that they could afford the higher limit 
That's the basis on which we thought we'd made a reasonable inquiry. Can I just explore that notion with you just a little further? Is it, is it right to see the bank as measuring its conduct uh, by reference to whether uh, the customer was not defaulting? and further measuring its conduct by reference to whether it estimated that the customer would not default on the credit card? Um, I think, again, we look at it on the totality of the information that we have with the customer. <coughs> the actual payment that they're making to the account is a good indicator of what, how they're, they're, they're handling that. If any of the examples, if you're unemployment, if you're unemployed and you're not receiving income, why would you be making payments to your credit card in excess of the minimum amount that you're required to, to make? It's not, you know, and it's scalable to the size of the increase that we're, we're making here. It's an existing customer with a limit already. <coughs> we're talking about maximum um, increases of $5,000, the average was about 2800 So it's proportionate to that additional commitment that we were making the reasonable inquiry based on the actual payment that they were making to the account. The contrast that's lying behind the reference to default is a contrast with any assessment of whether the customer could repay the total amount of the debt within any period, whether immediately over uh, a defined period of X months, X years, whatever. Yes, I, I would agree with your characterisation there and there that's where the other behavioural and transaction scoring that we were doing on that account were also indications of, of whether or not that customer would default or not. It was default, not repayment, is, is the contrast I'm inviting your attention to. Okay. And what I'm asking you in effect is, was the bank judging it according to a likelihood of default? It seems to me it was, rather than according to repayment within a necessarily arbitrary uh, time. Yes, sir. and that's the new <coughs> standard, the standard that was applying at the time, I agree with you, was to whether or not they could make their, their, their minimum obligations under the under the the, the facility because the credit card is a revolving facility that's that's in, not, not intended to be, it's not a, a term loan that's, a, that's expected to be paid back no. within a defined term. And that, um, having interrupted you, Ms Diaz, let me just continue a moment. The, the notion of a revolving facility is also important uh, in this sense, uh, uh, isn't it, that The assessments that are done look at, uh, or that were done at this time, looked at past practice uh, of the customer. Is that right? Yes, they took that into consideration. Their past expenditure patterns and, uh, in particular, relevantly, their past uh, servicing of the debt. Yes, particularly the recent servicing of their debt. I understand that. It Made, did it make any attempt to predict or take account of whether the customer's spending patterns might change if further credit was allowed? For the purpose of the serviceability assessment? Or at all, at all. In, in any respect? I mean, yes, serviceability, uh, well, but at all? Well, I think uh, the reason we're offering a limit increase is that we, we, want, we want it to be used because we're a commercial enterprise. We want to yeah. grow the, 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 the book. Um, yeah. So, yes, we, if we were offering a limit increase, it was because we thought that the customer might want it, and if they do want it, then we can profit from that. And therefore, I, I, I understand that, and the, the point I'm tr 
trying to identify, and I forgive me if I'm not identifying it clearly, that uh, is my fault, not your fault. You look backwards, there's a temporal element to that. You look to the customer's spending patterns as well as income uh, experience in the past. Is that right? Yes, we do. And the purpose of the credit limit increase, uh, at least from the bank's point of view and probably from the customer's point of view, uh, will be to change the expenditure habits of the client. Is that right? Yes, there are many reasons. We could, we could sort of say a customer may have two different credit cards and we want them to use our credit card, not the other one. Um, we want them to, to if, if they spend more, we earn more revenue on a, both on an interchange basis. If they revolve, we earn interest income. So yes, from the customer, but we look not just at the customer's spending patterns, but we also look at their behaviours and their past and the way that they're servicing not just this debt, but all of their debts with us. And the question which then emerges is the reliability of what you get by looking back for determining what the position will be in the future when the hypothesis is that the customer's spending patterns will change. Yes. Do you see the problem that no, I do, I'm trying to uh, identify so poorly, but... Yeah, no, I, I, I understand um, <coughs> what you're saying. And in my statement, I talk about when we're assessing credit risk, generally, we're looking at three tests. We're looking at whether or not the customer can afford the credit limit, but we're also looking at the behaviour of that customer, not just on this account, but on all their accounts. And it's that element of it. And then there's a third element, which is what's their financial situation should they get into some sort of difficulty through you know, whether unemployment, illness um, uh, and other life events, what, what have they got to be able to, to weather that, those life events? The bit of those three things that is <coughs> most predictive about whether or not they will get into trouble on this debt is the second element of behaviours on the account. Whether or not they can afford the loan or not and how, by how far they exceed that test is somewhat counterintuitively not the best predictor about whether or not they'll be able to service that debt. You measure it against whether uh, their past payments have been such that they could have met the minimum payments for the new increased limit. That's right. So we're testing their ability to pay, but in, in all of these tests, whether or not they can pay, really it's how well they've handled their, their finances um, is a better predictor about whether they'll get into trouble with this. And that's why we put such store in the inquiries that we make about behaviour um, on those accounts, not just with us, but with, with others as well. Yes. Yes, thank you, Ms. Dears. Uh, so I just want to recap on what you said there. So look, when we're looking at what Westpac had access to in terms of its data, it could be based on one account, just the credit card account, which would tell you nothing about numbers of dependents, for example, is that right? Well, we do get the numbers of defendants when the credit card is originated. So um, there is a, a, this is only for limit increases. So it's an existing customer that's, that's, um, that's, that's paying their credit card. But that could have changed? That could have changed, yes. So what I'm trying to get at is that, that the information you have can have changed and you are not trying to ascertain or verify whether it's correct. Uh, we're, not, we're not seeking new information for customers that, that um, are, are performing very well. So for this, this customer, you didn't seek to ascertain what his employment status was at the time? No, that's correct. And you would agree, therefore, that that would have been a reasonable thing to do, to find out whether he was working and earning an income that could have serviced that increase. Do you agree with that? Um, we, 
we could have asked the customer whether they were employed um, uh, at the time or whether their income had reduced. Um, and they could have told us or they might not have told us. But you didn't ask the question. I, I no, put to didn't. you that it wasn't reasonable to not ask the question. That was unreasonable. Do you agree with that? Well, our assessment at the time was that that was reasonable, but in, 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 in hindsight, um, you know, and with the guidance from, from ASIC, um, we, we did change that practice. Okay. Uh, you give a couple of other examples, but I'll just take you to one more in your statement. That's at uh, 0017. It's just further down. It starts at the bottom of that page. Mr Malcolm. Um, now that... Thank you. This, this, this customer, 14B, was provided a CLI and had been arrears on their credit card for a period exceeding 60 days at some time before the CLI was offered. Now that, and they were also remediated. Uh, and over the page, maybe we can put them side by side. Thank you. Uh, so they had their limit increased from 6,500 to 8,500. Now, they hadn't been in arrears at the time of the offer, but as you say, they had been in arrears for over two months, uh, eight months before. Now, why wasn't that taken into account? Uh, yes, that would have been taken into account um, through, again, some of the behaviour scores that we, we would have um, uh, looked at as part of the, that process. Um, but if the customer has caught up um, those, those arrears and had been current for a period of eight months, their score would have improved um, uh, when, when this process would have been run and therefore they were deemed to be eligible. This, this person went on to say, contacted Westpac's assist service. This wasn't as part of the remediation. They identified the CLI had contributed to their hardship. And, and you say there in subparagraph C, the offer was made because the automated process had determined that the CLI was not unsuitable. Uh, don't you think it would have been reasonable to take into account that she had been in arrears for a period not, not very long before the CLI was offered? Do you agree now in hindsight that that would have been reasonable, Mr Mark? In, in hindsight, um, yes, if, if she was not in arrears at the time of the CLI, but if she had been in before, in, in, in this case, um, yes, I would say that. And then in subparagraph D, you note that during the remediation process she was called, this is in 2016, her CLI was in 2012, uh, she returned the call. During the call, the customer indicated that though she was not certain, she thought that she was employed on a part-time basis at the time the CLI was granted. She said she was, not, she was unsure whether her income had changed at the time of the CLI, and that she had not expected any significant change in her circumstances, but yet she was determined eligible for the remediation. Uh, again, wouldn't it have been prudent to check with her on her employment status at the time, assuming that she is right that, that perhaps it wasn't on a part-time basis? or even not on that assumption, sorry, Mr Malcolm, at all, just to check with her about her employment status. Do you agree? I accept that that's, that's now the standard for reasonable inquiries. Okay. Um, now, you're aware that the Australian Banking Code of Practice, uh, or by that code, uh, Westpac promises customers that it will exercise the care and skill of a diligent and prudent banker before extending credit, uh, and that's RCD 0021-0001-0174. And uh, the relevant pinpoint is 0196. Now, I believe this is a, a version that I think came into force at around 2013, but, but that, that clause there of 27, provision of credit, before we offer, give you or increase an existing credit facility, we will exercise the care and skill of a diligent and prudent banker in selecting and applying our credit assessment methods and informing our opinion about your ability to repay the credit facility. Now, one of Westpac's credit assessment methods at the time was this automated process. Do you agree that that was not a diligent and prudent process to adopt at the time? Uh, well, we believed it was a, a diligent process for the size of the limit that we were offering for um, a cut that was what was an existing customer. But you don't hold that belief now, do you, Mr Malcolm? Well, 
we've, we've certainly changed our practice that we do actually make direct inquiries about the customer's in income and employment status when we make a limit increase offer. Uh, now, uh, you've mentioned ASIC's guidance and what ASIC told lenders. I, I want to explore with you the chronology of Westpac's discussions. Oh, apologies, I should tend to that. Uh, Commissioner, Exhibit 1.169, 2013, Code of Banking Practice, RCD 0021 0001 0174. Thank you. Uh, and we've discussed the National Credit Act requirements. You're aware that ASIC provides guidance to lenders about their obligations under the Act. Are you aware of that, Mr Malcolm? Yes, I am. Uh, and there is a regulatory guide, 209, that was first published in 2010. Uh, and it's been updated over, over the years, but, but relevantly, I'll take you to one particular part of it that, that existed at the time. Uh, RCD 0021-0001-0088. That's the first page. Have you seen this document, Mr Malcolm? Are you familiar with that? Yes, I have. Uh, and RCD 0021-0001-0108. Uh, Uh, now, we might just put the two pages, the previous page, sorry, side by side with this one so that we can read. Thank you. Uh, so the rule down the bottom there, or the guide, 209.48, uh, we recognise that in certain circumstances, some credit providers will be able to verify a consumer's financial situation without receiving additional information from the customer. For example, a bank could look at a consumer's regular deposited salary the timing of credit card payments and the payment of other expenses. However, credit providers should take care of relying on such information which may not reflect the consumer's entire financial position. For example, if the consumer holds credit cards with other financial institutions. Now, would you agree that Westpac did not take care in relying on the information it had when it assessed uh, suitability of credit increases for the non-FCA customers? Sorry, can you repeat that? Do, do, you, do you agree that Westpac didn't take care for the non-FCA customers, those customers that weren't asked for further financial information, it relied on the information it had, which may not have reflected the customer's entire financial position? Do you agree that was a lack of care on Westpac's part at the uh, time? Yeah, uh, um, yes, we didn't make inquiries about um, debts at other financial institutions for our existing customers in this process. Uh, and you're aware that in September 2012, ASIC told banks, including Westpac, that inquiries about employment status and current income were the minimum inquiries that ASIC expected a bank should make before offering a credit limit increase? Yes, they sent a letter to the Australian Bankers Association. You refer to that letter in your statement, Mr Malcolm, but um, you don't exhibit that letter, do you? No, no I haven't. Uh, well, I'll take you to that letter. Uh, WBC 099-001-2054. Okay. So that letter is addressed to the policy director of Australian, of ABA. And Westpac would have received or did receive a copy yes. of this yes, contemporaneously, would you say, in September 2012? Yes. Thank you. Uh, and I'll just read the first paragraph, Mr Malcolm. Uh, the purpose of this letter is to communicate ASIC's views in relation to credit card limit increase invitations and relevant assessment processes in light of current responsible lending obligations and work that ASIC has been doing with the industry over an extended period of time. Just further down, in making an assessment as to whether a credit contract or credit limit increase is unsuitable, a credit provider is required to make reasonable inquiries about the consumer's requirements and objectives, make reasonable inquiries about the consumer's financial situation and take reasonable steps to verify the consumer's financial situation. And there's reference there to RG209 and we, we talked about that. And then further down, 
ASIC writes, we understand that credit card assessment processes, particularly assessment of applications made in response to unsolicited credit limit increase, <coughs> CLI, invitations, are typically largely automated in order to deal with high volumes of applications. Lending decisions are made quickly and manual intervention is the exception rather than the rule. Do you agree that that encapsulates accurately what Westpac's process was? Yes. Uh, and then over the page at 2055, perhaps thank you, uh, and at the top of the page, Westpac says, the use, uh, ASIC says, sorry, the use of highly automated processes, while arguably efficient for industry, creates a potential tension with responsible lending obligations that require assessment of each individual consumer's needs, objectives and financial capacity. Some card issuers have actively responded to their new obligations and now make direct inquiries of customers regarding relevant matters such as income and employment. In contrast, a number of card issuers continue to rely on minimal inquiry, often limited to a request that the customer acknowledge or confirm that they can meet proposed repayments and have not had in order not to see any adverse change in their financial circumstances. Now, would you say that that paragraph there, in, beginning in contrast, encapsulates what Westpac's approach was at the time? Um, well, again, the, we don't make direct inquiries to the customer, but in, in terms of our interpretation, it was the inquiries that we were making about the customer from the other information that we held. That was our view at the time. But it was a minimal inquiry, was it not, Mr Malcolm, at the time? Would you agree with that characterisation? Well, of the customer, yes, but yes. again, the, the totality of what we, were in, what, what we were inquiring to in our own systems was quite an extensive inquiry. Well, ASIC here is referring to an inquiry of the customer. Yes, I'd agree with Yes, thank you. Uh, and would you agree that Westpac relied on acknowledgement or confirmation from the customer that they could meet the repayments and didn't foresee changes? We saw that in the letter. Would you agree with that, that that is uh, corroboration of that or consistent with that yes. approach? Thank yes, you. I'd agree. With ASIC, sorry, I'm reading on here. ASIC acknowledges that it is useful to ask customers about recent and foreseeable or foreseeable changes to their financial circumstances. We think, however, that responsible lending also requires direct inquiry about a customer's current financial circumstances, so that the card issuer, not the customer, can assess suitability. That's pretty clear, isn't it, Mr Malcolm? It's telling Westpac and other lenders what ASIC expects of lenders. Yes. And further down, despite that, and while continuing to encourage more extensive inquiries where appropriate, ASIC's current view is that before approving a CLI application, card issuers should at least make inquiries about and ascertain a customer's current level of income and employment status. And you would agree that Westpac did not do those things for the non-FCA customers in the relevant period. Do you agree with that, Mr Malcolm? Yes, I do. And further down, ASIC says, given that these obligations have now been in effect for over 18 months, where we identify continued non-compliance, ASIC will consider the full range of available regulatory responses, including enforcement action, where necessary. I'll tender that letter, Commissioner. Thank you. Exhibit 1.170, letter ASIC to ABA, 12 September 2012, WBC 0990012054. Thank you, Commissioner. So Westpac received this letter, uh, and you, you would agree with me that it makes clear what ASIC wants lenders, including Westpac, to do? Yes, it does. And yes. And in your statement, you refer to discussions and considerations by members of the credit risk, regulatory affairs and product teams about that letter. And that's at paragraph 62 of your statement. Sorry, paragraph? Uh, 62, Commissioner. Thank you. I want to show you an email from 5 October 2012 which records discussions by the 
people that you've referred to. Just before the letter, yes. uh, the letter has come down, the letter followed uh, a deal of uh, discussion between uh, Bankers Association and ASIC, did it not? Uh, yes, and also discussion with direct with banks as well. We had a number of discussions with ASIC, both in the lead up to and and um, the the implementation of, of that about what reasonable inquiries means and those kinds of things. And the banks advocated their view of what uh, was and was not reasonable. Yes. And what comes back is ASIC's uh, uh, response in formed in part by reference to uh, what the bankers had put to them. Yes, um, and there was a paragraph in that letter which um, council didn't read, which was talked about scalability as well. <laughs> and you're going to explain scalability to me, are you, Mr Malcolm? I was, I was hoping you could explain it to me. <laughs> <laughs> That's the impression I have from other witnesses, that it's, it's a... Uh, quite seriously, it, it, it's an expression that's found throughout the documents. What do you understand it to mean, or do well, you have any useful content that you can give me about it? Well, it, it was it was one of the vexed areas um, during this whole period of time because new legislation um, and a um, new guidance, and but there was within the guidance there was an acknowledgement that for um, existing customers, customers where the, and the size of the the increase was small relative to their um, their income, or it was not a complex um, uh, uh, credit contract, and that the customer had the capacity to understand it, that reasonable inquiries could be less than it would be if it was all of the things that they were not. So it did, in, did require some degree of interpretation and in this, it's really the nub of this, this case is that we'd interpret it for small credit limit increases of up to $5,000 for existing customers that we'd, we'd assess that that was what, what was reasonable. ASIC in this letter, I think, is giving a guide as to what they thought was reasonable as well. Yes. Yes, Mr. Yes. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, so the, the, the next document is WBC.099.001.04. We were just talking about uh, discussions that were held around this time at Westpac. And this email is dated 5 October 2012. And you can see that the heading um, ASIC letter RL, I read that to be responsible lending concerns. Now, if you go up, scroll up a little bit further, please, operator, we can see it says notes from our meeting. This is, I take that to be a, a recording of, of what was discussed at this meeting, but you weren't attending this meeting. I, I don't purport to say that you were, but you know some of these people, uh, particularly Josh Moyes, he is uh, in the regulatory group, is that correct, in compliance? Yes, regulatory affairs. Is he a lawyer? I, Mr. Mel? I don't know. Uh, so the, the email says, uh, it's a bit hard to read, but it says ASIC raised issue at conference following their letter dated 12 September. Tension between automated CLI process versus RL, responsible lending. Mark's view that ASIC and WBC not aligned. Business took view in early RL days. Proxy for capacity to further service increase is the payment to balance ratio. Further credit assessment FCA segment. And further down, uh, FCA versus non-FCA, 30% to 70%, and we discussed that. That's, that's what the ratio was or the proportion, the split was. Is that correct, Mr Malcolm? Yes. yes. Uh, ASIC assert that all banks should make inquiries on current income and employment status. Group potentially almost there on first point of income, but not on source. ASIC's soft approach is now over. Firmer responses to be expected. <coughs> and then further down, non-FCA, nothing asked, nothing validated. Now, so at this time, do, do, can we take it from this email that Westpac realised that ASIC was serious about what it was saying in the letter? Yes. Yes. And what do you think... Uh, you don't know what the, re what the writer means, but firmer responses to be expected. Would that refer to enforcement action? Potentially. Yes. 
And when it says group potentially almost there on first point of income but not on source, uh, that, is that referring only to the FCA or, or both sets of customers that, that Westpac was thinking that because it had the original information in the original card application, perhaps it, was, it met that requirement? Is that...? I don't, don't know. know. Sorry. That's right. Thank you, Mr Malcolm. Okay, I tend to that email, Commissioner. Exhibit 1.171, WBC email 510-2012, re-ASIC letter, WBC 099-0010473. So shortly after that, Mr Malcolm, there was an exchange of emails. You've exhibited those to your statement at WDM 12. And uh, that the doc ID is WBC 099-0012070. Thank you. If we might go to the last page, I think. Uh, so 73 to 74, if we could put those <coughs> side by side, thank you. Thank you. Uh, now, prior to preparing your witness statement, had you seen this email chain before, Mr Malcolm? No, I don't recall seeing it. Okay. But you have seen it now in the preparation? I have, yes. Thank you. Uh, so the first email is dated the 8th of October, and some of the people that we saw from the last email are recipients here. And Mark Stewart is saying to Rob, uh, that they discussed this ASIC's letter, and then further down he says, it appears from their letter that ASIC consider that before approving a CLI, we at least make inquiries about and ascertain a customer's current one level of income and two employment status. Whilst we gather current income and expense information for our FCA segment prior to CLI approval, we do not inquire about current employment status. We could take the view that by excluding based on age and un unemployment status, that we've already made reasonable inquiries. But this only applies to the segment where we have a transaction account relationship, likely to be in the minority. Further down, uh, Josh's view was that whilst the letter wasn't specifically directed at, AS at Westpac, and nor did it call for a response, ASIC will be expecting credit providers to tighten processes and raise standards to what they consider to be minimum, i.e. an employment status question slash checkbox. And then further down, there's the paragraph, whilst we only have CLI consent for circa 250,000 customers, and considering that the FCA segment comprises circa 30% of the CLI population, the current cost benefit associated with these changes would be unfavourable. However, however, I'd suggest that they are required if we want to continue to offer CLIs without intention or intervention from ASIC. Colin has spoken to product and will be able to advise their position on this. So uh, now Mark, Mark Stewart is the senior product risk manager. What position is that? Is that a, is that a, a, a compliance regulatory position? It's, a, it's, a, it's in the risk team, but it's, um, it reports to the head of unsecured risk. Okay. Well, you would agree that Mark is saying that expressing the view that we really do have to make this change. Yes. Okay. And then Colin is going to speak to product and advise what they think. And you said before about product being the business side, is that correct? Yes, yes that's right. Okay, and then further on the next page, we see that, that Josh Moyes, head of product and distribution regulatory affairs, group regulatory affairs, responds. Thanks, Mark. Only that when considering actions you might take, to the extent we make changes about employment status and income, the former probably seen by ASIC has substantiating the, the latter, then the regulator, I think, expects this for all CLI invitations, not only the C FCA. These distinctions might not be clear to ASIC. So Mark there is saying we should be doing this for all invitations. Is that correct? Yes. yes. OK. And then the next email, see, which is on... 2072, and perhaps we'll put the next two pages side by side, thank you. 2071 and 2072. Great. So this email from Mark back to Josh, Joshua and others. Uh, so he proposes three options there. 
one of which is to process all the CLI invitations as FCA. And he says, he says down the bottom, options one and two are the most change intensive, but are likely to provide a better business outcome and customer experience. Whilst option three is technically the easiest, it does increase the likelihood of non-response. TBC in a post-CLI consent environment. And then the next email we see is from one of the recipients, so Colin Twitchett, uh, project manager, compliance projects investments and partnering. Dennis, as below, noting Alice's call on Friday evening where she was opposed to doing anything until ASIC made a formal request. This view will be aired at the next meeting for wider consideration. Uh, <coughs> so, uh, do you know who Alla is, Mr Malcolm? I don't know her is. personally, but she's in the product team. Okay. So, she's part of the product side of it. Okay. Okay, and the next email is the 22nd of October from Dennis Cavestini, Program Manager, Compliance Projects. Hi Josh, what do you want to do with this one? The product view is to not do anything unless ASIC makes a formal request. Would you like to table this in the next Steer Committee Executive Working Group? Given the now differing points of view, point of views, I'd rather the business have an agreed view before the project considers it as a scope item. And so the differing points of view that he's referring to there, would you say, is, is the difference between the regulatory camp that's saying we really should be doing this and complying with what ASIC is saying, and the product team that's saying yes. we don't want to do it. The yeah. regulatory um, affairs team and the risk team presenting one point of view and the product team presenting an alternative. Okay. And then the next email after that, Joshua responds to Dennis on the 24th of October saying, SC attention is important. Uh, now, is SC the steering committee? Yes. Yes. Uh, any for further formal request is unlikely to arise in a non-confrontational setting. ASIC regards their letter to ABA as a friendly alert to all bank credit card issuers. So unless we are certain our approach is defendable, we would be inviting adverse regulatory attention and public outcomes if we did nothing at this stage and ASIC then engaged Westpac directly. Okay, so I think that's, again, with the regulatory side of the bank is emphasising that we really do need to do something yes, um, well, saying it's or a, defend our approach. That's right. So they're saying if you, if you want to go down a different approach, you've got to, be, you've got to have a defensible position. Okay, thank you. And then the final two emails are on that first page, 2070. Uh, Josh was, again writes, this is to Rob Love, and we saw that he was uh, the writer of the first email that we came to today. Uh, Hi, I'm not sure where this is up to, but I'd like to know whether you've discussed this with David Malcolm, that's yourself, or product, and whether it's a matter of the sustainable banking NCCP steering committee needs to consider. Now, this committee, do you, can you tell the Commission a bit, bit about that committee? What, what was it set up for? Um, the committee was the, was the steering committee for the, the project changes for the credit card reforms that came in in 2012 um, and was managing our response to, to those changes, including what hadn't been um, implemented from the first round of the National Credit Act because the regulations came in Quite late, so there were there were still ongoing things that needed to be resolved from improving the processes from the from the compliance date. So it was essentially a, a, a project steering committee, but it had representatives from product, from risk, from the um, the project management team, uh, and regulatory affairs. So Josh was would attend that committee. And, and so any executives, senior senior people from the bank, is that correct uh, or not? Well. Senior executives from product and risk. Um, it was at that level. Yeah. Okay. And you yourself attended some of those meetings. Is that correct? I was. I was. The, the, I think I was the, the chair of the committee. But I would normally delegate that to Rob Love because it, he was the head of unsecured risk, and it it was it was really the project steering committee, and he um, had most of the the implementation issues within that. But he would. Um, inform me of, of, of any important issues if I didn't attend the meeting. 
Okay. And so when Josh says uh, to to Rob Love, have you discussed this with David Malcolm? Had you discussed this with Rob Love? I again, this is six years ago. I don't remember. Um, but look, it's it's possible that he did. I don't I don't I don't have specific records of, of having a discussion with him. And you do you were aware of the letter, the the ASIC letter, or you said oh, that was, you were yes, aware of that yes, at the I was time. Aware of the yes, and you were aware discussions were ongoing in the in the group or between these two groups. I I was aware about that. Okay. And then the final email is from Mark Stewart to Joshua Moyes. Hi Josh, I was unaware of product reluctance to amend anything and had hoped to get everyone together this week, Colin to organise, to settle on a consensus position. Rob and I believe that doing nothing is not an option, but how much we do, do needs to be agreed. Given that the CLI population have now self-selected themselves via consent, I would argue the number of questions we ask is no longer as correlated to response rates as was the case the pre-NCCP. The three scenarios I outlined earlier still apply. No one has provided feedback or alternatives to me. So in this email, um, would you agree, Mark, Mark is again saying, Rob and I believe we, we can't do nothing. We've got to um, act on what ASIC's telling us. And he actually says here as well, would you agree that maybe it, it won't hurt us too much in terms of the, the population that is targeted because we no longer circulate, um, it's not almost correlated to response rates. Would you agree with that? There's yeah, a few so questions there, Ms Malcolm. Sorry about that. But <laughs> would you agree that at least he's saying we can't do nothing? We've got to do... We've got to act on this. We've got to make a decision. That's... that's I mean, it's, it's sort of... It's a series of, of questions and, and discussions around what do we need to do in response to the letter and we can't just do nothing and hope it goes away. So, so you're understanding this to be that we have to make a decision but not necessarily the one that would follow ASIC's guidance? Uh, well, not... To, exactly. OK. Uh, well, in the end, Westpac did do nothing about the ASIC letter. Is that correct? For two years, for about two years? Well, there was a discussion and a decision made. So they, they had a discussion between risk and, and product, um, and they made a decision that, based on, the, the, on the, the basis of the totality of the current process, that they felt that that was um, enough to satisfy the reasonable inquiries without making direct inquiries of employment and, un and income for those customers that they deemed that showed adequate um, uh, information from our, our own data. So yes, they, they didn't implement the change that ASIC. Uh, and in your statement you say that ASIC's views on whether Westpac's processes need to change were escalated to the, the steering committee that you talked about before. Um, and I suggest to you that that was because of the gravity of what was being discussed and suggested here in these emails and discussions, is that correct? Yes. yes. Uh, and a steering committee met to consider this issue on 12 November 2012, there was a meeting. Uh, you've exhibited some minutes and action items at WDM 13, that's WBC 050 Yep. So we can see there, as you said before, that uh, Rob Love is the chair and he's your delegate yes. for that meeting, yes. Uh, but he would normally tell you about what happened in the meeting. You would discuss it with him afterwards. Yes. Yes. Okay. And on the next page, see under general business, the heading responsible lending and CLI invitations. Uh, Jay Moyes, I believe that's Joshua Moyes, raised concern regarding the need to be proactive in relation to a recent ASIC letter to ABA, which advises that salary and employment status should be checked prior to offering CLI invitations. Our love noted that a more detailed offer letter is already available and a new business position may need to be developed. This was accepted to be a BAU issue that should be resolved by product, risk and compliance. RL to report back on conclusion. That reference to BAU issue, is that business as usual issue? Yeah. Yes, that's correct. And why was it accepted to be a business as usual issue? Uh, I think what they're saying in, in that is that they're saying that the, 
the requisite people required to make that decision, empowered to make that decision, was decided to be um, uh, product risk and compliance rather than it being escalated to any higher level within within the bank at that time. It was a very serious decision, wasn't it, to, to take not to follow what the regulator was telling Westpac to do? Well, the, the decision was to, to analyse whether what we were doing was, was um, uh, compliant with that. And what Other than, I mean, I wouldn't characterise it. They didn't think of it at the time as not directly not doing what ASIC asked them. They were thinking of it as, do is what we do compliant with with that? And was there any consideration given in that analysis to whether uh, or to the possibility that some sales of credit limit increases may be unsuitable? Yes. Because I don't, uh, what I notice about uh, the email chain you looked at previously uh, is first, it seems to me, to emphasise that Westpac regarded credit limit increases as important. Is that right? Yes. Commercially important? Yes. And that what is absent from that email string and at least subject to correction, the other documents that we've looked at, is any consideration of whether it is possible that CLIs in some cases may be unsuitable because the customer's circumstances have changed. You accept that that's... Um. A notable ab uh, that first it is absent and then that it's a notable absence? Well, I think that the consideration was that the CLIs for this group were considered low risk. Um, so I, I, that's the, the consideration around suitability and compliance with the, the, the re responsible lending obligations. I, I agree, it's, it's, I would characterise it the way that you did, but, but certainly that they, the feeling of the risk and product teams was that this group of customers, because of what we knew of them, about them, that the risk of, of, of adverse outcomes for them was low. That the ones at the edge of capacity may be those who take up, say, uh, an extension of their credit limit by $1,500 in the hope that that'll get them over the hurdle. Is that right? I, well, again, it's, it's a bit hard to think of that in abstract without knowing the, the actual outcomes of, of, of these customers. And again, my, I have it in my statement, but when you look at the population of, of customers, the general credit, credit card population, the actual adverse outcomes customers that defaulted was around 2% around this time. For customers that went through the FCA process, the, the default rate was about 0.7 times, so less than half. And for the customers that went through the non-FCA process, it was only 0.38 times. So the views of the, of the risk people were driven by that they thought these customers were customers that we know very well from the information that we have and are low risk. But so that's Low risk of default. L yes. In that Not case. any consideration of whether they could repay the debt within a reasonable time or a fixed arbitrary time. That's, that's true. They weren't, they weren't looking at it at a reasonable time. They were Wait, looking what's at lying? Did you yeah. read the evidence of Ms Cox at the uh, opening of the, uh, this round of evidence by any chance, Mr Malcolm? Um, I watched a little bit of it, yes, but I didn't watch the whole thing. No. I think I'm right to remember that she gave the example of someone buying a pair of jeans and still paying for it five, six years later because they've just been able to keep up the minimum payments for five or six years. Yes, and, and that, uh, that's I, I, not uncommon amongst revolvers, is it? Well, well I, what I would suggest is if, if that is what the customer has, then the better product for them is not a revolving product. It's a term product that actually does pay off over time and they'll pay it off quicker. 
exactly so. And there was no consideration given uh, by Westpac in offering these credit limit increases to whether this product, revolving product, was appropriate or instead the customer would be better off with a fixed term personal loan. Well, one of the rules that we had in the exclusion rules was, was very high utilisation. So for exactly that kind of customer, we didn't yeah. offer them. Yeah. But it's, in, it's in Westpac's interest to maximise the number of revolving customers. You would agree with that, <coughs> Mr Malcolm? Um, we, we want customers to be able to afford their, their loans. It's in our interest for them not to default as well. Not but to yes, default entirely. Yes. You, you want them to keep making the minimum repayments and pay interest. You don't want them to default entirely, but you do want them to keep paying the interest and repayments. Not, you don't want them to be transactors, in other words. I wouldn't... Would, no, we, we're happy with transactors as well. Transactors, uh, we earn revenue a different way from transactors. Um, so but they're not as profitable, are they, Mr Malcolm? Well, uh, they can be. Well, in your statement, you refer then to a meeting that took place on or around 4 December 2012 between Rob Love, Head of Unsecured Risk, and Nicole Lindner. I haven't started looking at interchange fees, Mr Malcolm. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not suggesting I will either. <laughs> but that's, that's the transactor, isn't it? That's right. So, yeah. you know, sorry, Mr. Yes, I shouldn't no, interject. Fine. It is a complex product, and I don't. I, it, and I, I'm. We we have to when we're looking at these transactors and revolver uh, revolvers, and they do switch over time. Some will be transactors when they take out the loan and have full intention of paying back each month, and others will take a make a purchase and pay it off over, over time, and others um, will, will revolve from month to month. Uh, and you just return to the chronology in December that Rob Love and Nicole Linda, she's head of credit card product, had this discussion that you refer to. Um, now, you, you <coughs> weren't involved in the discussion, but you've spoken with them since, have you, about what they discussed, or was that at the time? Um, I've... I don't recall speaking to them at the time, but um, I have spoken to Rob Love since. And uh, I might take you to this part of your statement. WIT 0001 So you refer to their, their meeting. And at 65 uh, A and B, you say they were both of the view that Westpac's approach remained appropriate and the process taken by Westpac to determine if a customer was an FCA customer or a non-FCA customer remained the prudent approach and met Westpac's obligations as a responsible lender. Uh, would you agree that it wasn't an appropriate approach to adopt because West ASIC was telling Westpac at this time to make those minimum inquiries about income and employment? Um, I the basis of their decision, I also set out um, what, what in in my view, what they should have done if they believed that um, that that was a was an adequate approach would be to have, have gone to ASIC and engaged with ASIC at the time, and either got them to um, agree that that's a that's a that our total approach did meet the the standard of reasonable inquiries or not, and that's in essence to me. The, the nub of this this issue is that they didn't, even if they believed, which they did, that it met the standards of reasonable inquiries, um, that that they should have gone to ASIC at the time. Well, Westpac did have discussions with ASIC after that for over a year, Mr. Mr. Malcolm, and and tried to explain its processes. And ASIC didn't accept that they were adequate. Is that correct? Yes. So um, we didn't. We in uh, we didn't we didn't change our approach, um, and when ASIC came to the banking industry, it was January 2014, um, and did a further survey of um, credit active credit card um, practices. Um, we we told them, and they actually were aware that we were still using the same process, and that prompted a series of of, of questions from ASIC, which we. We had, as, as you say, ongoing discussions with them as to whether or not um, 
we were complying with, with that letter. So there was that dialogue across that period? You would agree from, with that? From January 14 onwards. Uh, the next committee meeting was December 2012. And that's, uh, there's a minutes for that that you've exhibited, WDM 14. And that's WBC.050.097.6212. So again, we've got a chair here who is your delegate. Uh, now, perhaps if we go to the next page, there's a status update. Uh, someone's reported back to the steering committee on the outcome of those business as usual discussions that we talked about. Status update, AFS risk and product have reviewed the current CLI letter strategy and remain comfortable with the current approach, which includes sending an offer letter with content aligned to ASIC's recommendation to approximately 30% of customers receiving offers. The remaining 70% of offers are made to customers with a strong group relationship, including customers with regular salary deposits in transaction accounts. As such, an abridged CLI offer letter will continue to be sent to this segment. Now, that 70%, there's a reference there to it, including customers with regular salary deposits. And that, that's not all customers, isn't it? There were many customers who just had the credit card account, which wouldn't have shown those deposits. There were some customers that only had a credit card account. And the reference to a strong group relationship, that wouldn't be accurate in some cases. Some customers would only have a credit card account with Westpac and no other transaction accounts at all. Yes, Do you agree with that? Yes. So this, this conclusion that's reached is that they will effectively, Westpac will effectively do nothing, which is the approach that the product team wanted, yes? Yes. So in your statement, you say no changes were made to Westpac's processes until ASIC commenced its investigation in around August 2014. And then in December 2014, Westpac put its credit card offers on hold while ASIC investigated. Now, you're aware that ASIC issued various notices throughout this period yes, to I Westpac? Am. Yes. yes. I'll just take you to a couple of those notices, Mr Malcolm. One is ASIC 0010-0005-0489. So we can see this is one of those notices that's been sent to Mr Moyes. And the first paragraph refers to ASIC's monitoring of industry implementation of the National Credit Act. And the reasonable inquiries that we mentioned earlier today. And then there's a reference to the September 2012 letter. Uh, in September 2012, ASIC communicated its views <coughs> to peak industry bodies. And that's, you would agree that's a reference to that ABA letter we talked about? Yes. Uh, and then the next paragraph. ASIC's view is that before approving a credit card limit increase in application, card issuers should at least make inquiries about and ascertain a customer's current level of income and employment status. Additional inquiries may be necessary depending on the age of information held by the card issuer. <laughs> However, we expect to see this base minimum level of inquiry. So again, that's making pretty clear, isn't it, Mr Malcolm, what ASIC was expecting of Westpac? Yes. Yes. And on the next page, uh, page two, you could put them side by side perhaps, would help. Thank you, operator. We're missing a page. Is page point zero four nine zero available? If it's not, I'll read it out. No, it's not. Okay, it's blank for some reason, Commissioner, but I will read it. I will do my best. The purpose of this letter is to seek information about your current credit card limit increase processes. The information sought is limited to both the customer initiated limit increase application and assessment process and the issuer initiated limit increase application and assessment process. As a result of previous discussions between ASIC and Westpac, we are aware that Westpac's written credit card limit increase invitations 
largely relied on self-certification by customers. That is, Westpac did not make inquiries about a customer's income or employment and relied on the customer to determine whether the proposed credit limit was appropriate. Now, and the letter also says, however, our understanding may be outdated and we would appreciate your confirmation or correction in response to this request. And so ASIC requested information about what Westpac's processes were. Do you recall being aware of this at the time, Mr Malcolm? Were you told about um, this process? This sorry, at the time I was in New Zealand. So, I see, okay. Um, you, you've seen these notices since? I've seen these notices since, yes. Uh, I'll turn to that letter, Commissioner. Exhibit 1.172, uh, ASIC letter 13 January 14 uh, to Westpac, ASIC uh, treble zero, zero 0010, uh, treble zero 050489. Thank you. Uh, now, there were further notices sent and other correspondence. I'll, I won't go into detail with them, but I will, I will tender them. Uh, one is ASIC 0010-0005-1008. Sorry, you called that a notice, but I believe that was a request. It was a survey of current practices. I don't oh, think apologies, it was actually yes. A... I think that that's correct, Mr Malcolm. I think I simply described it as a letter. I'm fine with that. I just wanted to make sure that... Yes. There, but there were notices in this period, Mr Malcolm. You agree with that? Um, I, I believe the chronology is that this was a, uh, a request to a number of industry participants around their current um, practices in credit cards. Um, the notices came later once the results of the survey came in at, oh, in, in August 2014. It's the I chronology I understood. I see. Well, this, this letter is undated, but it does refer to a notice uh, in the first line, we refer to the section 253 notice attached to your letter dated 15 August 2014. So does that accord with your understanding of the chronology, Mr Malcolm, that a notice was received in August? In August 2014, Then this yes. response. Thank yes. you. Uh, and then this response is uh, Westpac providing its explanation of West Westpac's approach to the credit card limit increases and the methodology. And, and it, it contains... Uh, quite a lengthy sort of description of the approach. Would you agree? Uh, yes. yes. Uh, and it's it, actually the content's very similar to what you have in your statement about that process. Yes, I hope so. Yes. <laughs> I tend to that letter, Commissioner. Thank you. Exhibit 1.173, letter WBC to ASIC re section 253 notice dated 15 August 2014, ASIC 0010-0051008. Uh, now, a further letter from Westpac to ASIC explaining the process again uh, is WBC.300.001.033. So this is this is early 2015, 20 February 2015. If we scroll up a little bit, we can see that date. So again, uh, Westpac, uh, the writer is saying, we refer to your <coughs> letter, ASIC's letter, dated 6 February 2015, requesting an explanation as to how we determine the actual amount of a credit limit increase, CLI, that a customer will be invited to apply for. Our response is set out in Schedule 1, and there's many pages that follow that have, again, all that the processes and the automated, the descriptions of the automated processes. So this is months and months of, well, tra over months, there was this dialogue and exchange of information. Is that correct, Mr Malcolm? Yes. So yes. we also had a meeting with ASIC in, in October 2014 as well to explain the process because it is, you know, it's... Complicated. Com well, it's thorough. <laughs> uh, well, did you intend that meeting, Mr Malcolm? No, I didn't. Um, I'll tend to that letter. Give it 1.174, letter ASIC to West... Uh, sorry, it's letter West... West Pack, Pack to West. ASIC. Thank you. So we can 20 see that... Fe just one moment. Oh, 20 February 2015, WBC, 
Uh, three double zero double zero one zero three three one. Thank you. So over this period, Mr Malcolm, you would agree, Westpac's providing a great deal of detail about its automated process around making these offers. Yes. yes. It's trying very hard to convince ASIC that its processes are fine, yes? Yes. Because it wanted to avoid having to make the changes that ASIC was telling it to make. Is that correct? Um, well, actually, there's a couple of intervening issues as well. In November 2014, ASIC um, issued a, an update to RG209, um, which essentially repeated the... the um, the, the requirement to make specific inquiries. So by that stage, and in fact in, in around September 2014, before Westpac met with ASIC, we'd already decided to implement that change and in fact had commenced a project to implement that change by March 2015. Sorry, decision date is when? I don't know exactly when the decision date date is around September 2014. September 14, implementation was March Aimed 2015. For March 15. Yes. And achieved yes. that implementation date? It was yeah. achieved in 2015. And we did, in December 2014, we ceased suspended CLI offers um, uh, in whilst, whilst we were um, looking at this, this change. Yes. So the sequence we, we met with ASIC, obviously had a discussion with them about the process. RG209 came out um, and we ceased, we suspended CLI offers until such time as the, um, uh, as the, the changes had been made in March 2015. And in fact, we didn't reintroduce them until sometime later after we'd done the, agreed the remediation with ASIC. And the very first step in the process, though, was the letter from, a, from to the ABA in 2012. 2012, that's right, yes. Yes, September 2012. Okay. Uh, well, at the end of 2014, uh, there was a, a group unsecured credit policy at Westpac. You exhibit this to your statement. This is WBM-11, WBC 0990022800. This is the only policy from the relevant period that you've exhibited to your statement, is that correct? Yes, yes. I believe so. You, you say actually that there's no specific policy or procedure manual for credit limit increases, is that correct? Or at this time there was not? No, not, in, not in the form of a policy like this. It's embedded in the rules of, of, the, of, of the process, if you like. Do you mean the program, the, the automated process? Yes. That's the policy in no, that? No, sorry, this is the policy. This yeah. is the only policy? This is the only policy that I'm aware of at the time. Is this still the only policy, Mr Malcolm? Um, no, we, we, well, we still have a um, consumer credit policy, um, but we also have now introduced a responsible lending policy and a responsible lending manual, which um, goes into more detail around um, the requirements for responsible lending. When was that introduced, Mr Malcolm, the responsible lending policy and the manual? Uh, in 2016, and it was updated in 2017. Let's see. When was it updated in 2017? I believe June. So at this time, until 2016, this was all that you had at Westpac to guide bankers and, and Westpac itself on responsible lending around unsecured credit? Yes, and uh, it was the only policy that we had. There were training manuals and other materials, but, but this was the policy. I see. Uh, if we go to point 2822, there's a heading there, credit cards, and we can see there at the top, date last updated 5 December 2014. So this is the end of 2014, by which time your Westpac is aware of RG209 being amended, yes? Yes. Yes. Okay. And we <coughs> see there 10.1.2 credit card, credit limit increases, sorry. When a customer applies for a credit card limit increase, their serviceability will be assessed under the following guidelines. 
The customer will be required to acknowledge their ability to service the increased limit. The customer will be made aware of the increase in minimum monthly repayments based on the new limit and will be required to disclose any significant change in personal financial circumstances that may impact their ability to service the increased repayment. Income verification may be requested. So would you agree that policy did not implement what was in ASIC's guideline, the regulatory guideline 209, about requiring, not making it, making it mandatory to require income verification? Yeah, not in the policy, no. And there's nothing in here about ascertaining debts of the customer? Not in the policy. Do you agree that these guidelines contain very little that would require Westpac to inquire about the customer's current financial situation at the time of the limit increase? Yes. The, the policy is a high-level document. The actual processes and procedures that were implemented um, go beyond what's in the sort of high-level policy. So in the actual letters that were sent out um, and the automated process would require um, those, those assessments to be made where they were required. Well, why have this document at all, Mr Malcolm, if it doesn't mean anything? It, yes, it's supposed to be a high level indication to a customer and that is one of the reasons why we've given more um, and better guidance through the Responsible Lending Manual um, to supplement this as well as training for our, custom, uh, our bankers. Um. So who is intended to read this document, Mr, Man Mr. Uh, Malcolm? Who, who is the audience? The, either bankers in the in the in the network or um, or, or credit officers. So uh, people who are assessing the credit risk are told that. Not well, solely on this. No, they would they would also have procedures in their in their own business units as to how to implement these. I I, I don't have those those. You you I don't think. exhibit those to your no, statement though. No. Now, I want to go to your statement at paragraph 68, uh, WIT 0001 0014 0015. <coughs> now, at paragraph 68, you say, with the benefit of hindsight, I consider that the approach that Westpac took to communicating with ASIC about the issues raised in the ASIC letter was inappropriate in all the circumstances. While Westpac had a general view about the soundness of its approach to CLI offers, the appropriate approach would have been for Westpac to commence a dialogue with ASIC at the time and explain why it considered that its approach of only seeking additional income and expense information from customers which were assessed to be in the FCA category and not doing so for the non-FCA category met Westpac's obligations. Now, we've just been through some of the correspondence. You agree with me that you had that dialogue, Westpac had that dialogue with ASIC, do you not? Not, not at the time. Do not you at, mean not, in September 2012? Yes, we didn't, didn't have that dialogue with ASIC at the, at, in September 2012. Well, do you agree that ASIC had made clear to Westpac its expectations of compliance and yet Westpac continued to ignore what ASIC was saying? I'm, I'm saying that once the decision had been made um, at the, the Rob Love, Nicole Linda meeting, that having made that decision, we should have then taken that position to ASIC and said, this is how we believe we comply with the, le the, the letter that you've, um, that you've sent to the ABA but that wasn't done at the time. It was, we've concluded that we, um, we, com we comply uh, with that letter, with, with your letter, um, and that um, if, if they wanted to take, if they wanted to make inquiries of us, we should wait. I don't believe that was the right approach. We should have gone to them. Well, ASIC did have to approach Westpac and other lenders about this issue, and you pointed that out. Um, 
You're, you're aware that ASIC held discussions with the chairman of Westpac about this issue and other issues in 2015. Do you, are you aware of that? Uh, I have been made aware of that. Uh, well, actually, I knew that they, they attended the board in March 2015. Uh, so in March 2015, you were aware at that time you were oh, aware I of this? I wasn't aware at that time, but sorry, I have been... You became been aware as the part of preparing your statement? Preparing this your statement, evidence. Yes. I see. Uh, I'll take you to a document, ASIC.0010.2491. you need that number again? I'll read it again. ASIC.0010.0010.2491. Thank you. So this is a reference, this is a, uh, a list of speaking notes from a meeting that ASIC held with Lindsay Maxted, chairman of Westpac. So this is an ASIC document, Mr Malcolm, that the Commission has obtained. The meeting was to be held on Thursday, 28 May 2015. Purpose. Lindsay requested this meeting with you following the Commission's meeting with the Westpac Board on 3 March and your meeting with Brian Hartzer on 4 March. And you referred to that March meeting earlier, Mr Malcolm. Do you recall that? Uh, yes, I yes. referred to the Board meeting. I wasn't aware of the meeting with Mr Hartzer. And <coughs> you Were you aware of this meeting from May 2015? No. No. Uh, I'll just read the extract uh, from the first column. Of the big four banks, Westpac appears most resistant to ASIC and the laws we administer. Across DCI's multiple dealings with Westpac, there is a sense that they only tell us about issues when they think we are likely to find out about them through other means, and that they are reluctant to give us any more than the minimum possible amount of information, e.g. in complying with notices. There are some exceptions to this, e.g. Westpac was cooperative in a recent technical breach involving failure to provide FC, FSGs in some sales of consumer credit insurance. And further down, example, credit card limit increases. Despite clear messages about our expectations of compliance with responsible lending requirements by credit card issuers, and in contrast to the other card issuers, Westpac refused to change its practices until faced with the very direct threat of legal action. Do you agree with that statement there, Mr Malcolm, that it took the threat of direct I'd have legal to action? i up a bit, Ms Diaz. I think there's a number of statements there. That, yes, the statement that it took direct, the very direct threat of legal action to force Westpac to re change its processes. Um, well, I would say that we were having discussions with, with ASIC and we were, we were we were giving them information about um, our credit limit increase programs and we never sought to hide what we were doing in our credit limit increase programs. Um, but as I said, I do agree that we should have approached ASIC at the time. So from the sentiment that's expressed there that we um, didn't engage with ASIC until they, they were requesting a number of notices, I, I would agree. You have agreed already in your evidence that ASIC was clear about their expectations of compliance with responsible lending obligations? Yes. Yes. And you agree that it was clear from the September letter in 2012 what those expectations were? Yes. Yes. So you would agree that Westpac refused to change its practices until much later in the piece? Yes, I agree with that. Uh, on the next page... Uh, Thank you. After the responsible lending obligations commenced in 2011, DCI worked with industry to establish a bare minimum position in terms of the minimum inquiries a bank needs to make when inviting a customer to apply for a credit card limit increase. And there's a reference to the September letter. ASIC crystallised this minimum position in a letter to the whole of the industry. DCI went back to the whole, of the whole industry at the beginning of 2014 to assess the level of compliance and what issuers were doing above the bare minimum. To their surprise, they discovered that Westpac was not even doing the bare minimum. That is, it was not asking customers any questions before increasing their credit card limit. It was relying solely on its internal analytics. 
while ASIC has publicly said that internal analytics can play a role, we have also said that you need to ask the consumer, as a bare minimum, what their income is and if they are employed. This is because the responsible lending obligations apply at the individual borrower level. With Westpac the only bank defying ASIC's guidance from September 2012, DCI referred the matter to enforcement. As part of enforcement's investigations, they obtained an internal memo of a meeting Westpac had to discuss ASIC's letter from September 2012. The senior executive leader of DCI, Michael Sadat, noted that the memo recorded the following. Despite someone from regulatory affairs in Westpac cautioning against defying ASIC's guidance, the business instead insisted on ignoring ASIC's guidance. The business, as recorded in the memo, said, let's wait for ASIC to challenge us directly before changing our position. Now, I just, I'll just pause there. Uh, there was discussion between, you've said this, regulatory affairs or that group and the product team, and you've agreed that, that the conclusion was that nothing would be done. Do you agree that uh, the business said, let's wait for ASIC to challenge us directly <coughs> before changing our position? I, he's, that's, that's put in um, inverted commas as if, as if it was a quote, and I don't think that was actually what was said. But um, I agree that the, the, the emails from product um, did indicate that they thought that they should um, wait until there was a direct request from, from, from ASIC. Is it a fair summary, what appears in this document, of the position? Uh, well, the language is probably slightly um, stronger than I would have used. I don't think we were defying ASIC. We simply were had a different view, but um, but we were the last bank, so I, I uh, agree that, um, again, as I've said before, I thought in terms of what we should have done was to go to ASIC with that view, um, and and um, if that, at the, at the conclusion of those meetings, that they didn't agree that we were um, complying with the, with, with the policy, with the totality of what we were doing, then we should have implemented this change earlier. Um, so I, I agree with the sentiment that um, we didn't do enough to engage ASIC at the time we made that decision. Yes. And then down the bottom, there's, uh, Westpac was an outlier in terms of their position. Everyone else had accepted ASIC's position. And on the next page, 2493. Pausing three. there, is that right? Um, I, again, don't know exactly what, what the other banks were doing at the time, but, but certainly from the feedback that when we got that feedback from the ASIC survey that they did in January 2014, we got the results back sometime later that year that it did indicate that Westpac was the last to um, employ direct inquiries for employment and, and income, and which we implemented in March 2015. And, but we were suspended at the time, so we weren't actually doing it. And on that final page, despite ASIC outlining its position clearly in the letter of September 2012, Westpac ignored this and didn't bother to engage with ASIC in a discussion about this. ASIC only found out about it, as found out by conducting our follow-up review 15 months later. And that, that's true, you've mentioned that, about ASIC conducting the review, and that's how ASIC found out. Yes, that is how they found out, but in their opening of that letter, they actually indicated that they, they knew that that was our practice. If you recall, they said, we are aware of your, your practice, but if that's not true, update us. Uh, and then we would have expected a much more constructive engagement from Westpac, e.g. we disagree with you, ASIC, but let's talk about it. Um, and you said that that's your view. I agree. Is that right? Yes. yes. The business was able to overrule regulatory affairs compliance, which is indicative of poor culture and weakness in independent control functions. And do you agree with that, that, in, that the regulatory affairs and compliance was overruled by the product or business side of the bank? Um, I, I don't think they were overruled. The decision was made by a second line risk person in conjunction with the first line business person um, with the advice um, of regulatory affairs um, and, the, and legal were on that steering committee as well. So the steering committee 
delegated that decision to um, risk and, and product and they came to a decision. Now, I think, again, is that indicative of a, of, of a poor culture? Is that your question? Sorry. Well, who's second? What's Sorry, second? What was your answer, on? Mr Malcolm? I missed it. Uh, yeah, about culture. You said something about culture. What uh, did you say? Sorry, when I, when, I, when I talk about who made that decision, yes. it was approved by Rob Love, who's yes. in an independent control function. He's yes. in the risk team. And Nicole Linder, who's the head of cards, who was in the first line product team. Sorry, when I say first line, second line, we employ what's called the three lines of defence approach. The first line being the business that um, is originating loans. Um, the second line being an independent control function. The third line being um, uh, an independent assurance function or audit, if you more common I, language. I think I what I missed was you added at the end of your uh, answer, is that indicative of a poor culture? Is that your question? Well, let it be the question, is it indicative of poor culture? What do you say about that question? Well, if the, the premise is that the business was able to overrule yes. com compliance, and what I'm saying is that premise is not right because the second line actually approved the decision um, with the advice of, of regulatory affairs and compliance in the room. So it was that it was the wrong decision is different from a culture point of view, then it was not properly governed or indeed that the first line did indeed make the decision overruling the, the, the second line. So I, I, my, my answer to the, the question of whether the decision was made properly with the right authority, um, I think it was. I think we've strengthened governance since that time and I would like to think that if that same set of circumstances occurred today, that a different decision would be made. Because we saw in those earlier emails from October that people from the regulatory affairs compliance section were saying, we can't do nothing. Do you, did they maintain that approach? Um, well, again, they were still in the room when they, uh, at, the, at the steering committee when the decision was made and minuted. So, they acknowledged that the that we were taking a risk um, in in not in, in not doing anything, um, but that 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 they had agreed that the decision could be made at that level. When you say they agreed, you do you concede that they didn't want to adopt this approach? Yes, I do. And and that that will occur. Um, you you will get in an organisation. Um, uh, you know, different differing points of view, and you may try and make the best decision you can based on the available advice advice that you have. Um, and this was a this was a, a decision um, that was made by the people with the authority to make it. So ultimately, you would have to agree that because they were sitting there saying this is not our, this is not our, the approach we advocate, but the steering committee reached the decision to do nothing. Now, that decision was essentially in consonance with what the product team wanted, yes? Yes, the product team, yes, that is what the product team wanted. Okay. I'll tender that document, Commissioner. Uh, will be Exhibit 1.175, ASIC speaking notes for meeting with Chairman of Westpac, 28 May 2015, ASIC 0010, 0010. 2491. Uh, now, I want to take you to another ASIC document. Before you depart from it, Sorry, uh, sure. Ms Diaz, uh, do you accept that uh, ASIC, uh, rather, do you accept that uh, uh, Westpac uh, in effect, declined ASIC's request uh, to order its affairs in a particular way. Um, I, 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 again, my characterisation is that we believed that, rightly or wrongly, that what we were doing met the re requirement for reasonable inquiries, but it didn't meet ASIC's um, guidance, and so therefore, <laughs> yes. 
you, uh, that is, the bank acted in accordance what it, with what it then judged to be the legal requirement rather than ASIC's uh, request. Yes. Is that right? Yes, I agree with that. Uh, that is, uh, it uh, complied with what it regarded to be its legal obligation rather than what ASIC had told the bank. ASIC thought the bank's obligations entailed. Yes, that's right. And I would say if we took that differing view, we should have gone to ASIC and, and made the case for that. And if that was rejected, then we should have changed. It's the, that's, that's my view. So that <clears throat> the bare fact that the regulator uh, tells you that uh, it considers that the law requires a step or series of steps is not something that was then regarded as determinative of the position? Um, I would say in terms of regulatory relationships, there will be times where you won't agree exactly with interpretations exactly, but when th those, those occur, the better practice is to go to the regulator and um, state your case as to why you think your process meets or goes beyond the requirement, the, is a better practice and then if, therefore would be compliant. Um, ignoring the regulator is not a good idea. Never a good idea and uh, the better practice would not be to stop what you were doing and go and talk to the regulator? Yes. That would be the better practice? Yes, that would be the better practice. Stopping the practice has not hitherto been something you have ever mentioned, I think, in uh, your description of what would have been the better course of action. Am I wrong? Um, no, other than when we did go to ASIC and make the, and have the discussions with ASIC and got ASIC's views back, that we did stop. Yes, uh, after you had failed to persuade ASIC. That's right. Yes. What I'm trying to uh, get you to comment on is the regulator expresses its view. Should the bank act in compliance with that view until it can, comp until it can persuade ASIC to the contrary? Or should it continue along the path it is following while it seeks to pursue, uh, it seeks to persuade ASIC to the contrary. Um, yes, in uh, that case. I did intend it as an either or. Uh, sorry, it if should, I didn't articulate it, it I'm should, sorry. So <laughs> if if we haven't convinced ASIC, then then I mean, in in the case of the this letter, and I, I really can only speak to the specifics of this circumstance. Um, the, the ABA letter in 2012 um, didn't have, you must do this from this certain date. No. It said, we expect you to do this. So yeah. in that case, would I have um, advocated ceasing until we were doing that? No, but if we were deciding not to do it, um, then I would have, you know, again, the, I think the right course of action would have been to go to ASIC. If the ASIC said no, then stop doing it. Yeah. it it's because the, if, the, if the ASIC set out a, a regulatory guide um, and and said here is here here is um, uh, the rule and um, it may, must be complied with by this date. Um, if you were planning to do it after that date, I, you either get the ruling or stop it on that date until such time as you've convinced them. The, uh, what I'm searching for, Mr. Malcolm, and I, I, I'm at fault. You're not. I'm not seeking to criticise your answers. So the fact that I persist is uh, a reflection on me. It's not a reflection on you. What I'm trying to get hold of is what's Westpac's attitude today? If ASIC says, we think the better view of the law is X, Would Westpac act on that and 
obey that construction of the law or would it continue on its course while it sought to persuade ASIC to the contrary? Uh, I think we would obey the law and unless we made the, made the case and if there was a date by which that, that, that this is when it should cease, we should obey that too. And I, I would say we have strengthened, partly as a result of this, but, but also the other incidents that have been in our submission, um, that overarching guidance with dealing with, with, with regulators um, in particular, but ASIC as well. Can I cease by uh, asking you this question? Do you manage to obligation, or do you manage to regulatory request? Do you understand the distinction I'm drawing? Can you help me with that do a little bit? <laughs> manage to what you understand the letter of the law requires, or do you manage to what the regulator tells you it thinks the law re requires? I, I think I think my best answer is both. <laughs> yes, Mr. Diaz. Yes. Uh, I want to take you to another ASIC document, uh, ASIC 0010-0062255. This is from 2015, Mr. Malcolm. Again, you won't have seen this, 18 June 2015. This is an enforcement meeting held at ASIC. I just want to hone in on that number of possible contraventions and profits. So this is about the CCLI practices at Westpac and this continuing issue. ASIC does not have concerns about the inquiries made of FCA customers and the investigation only relates to non-FCA customers. The total number of non-FCA bank-initiated CCLI invitations from March 2011 <coughs> to November 2014 was almost 2.4 million, 78% million, of the total. The remainder were FCA. Of the 2.4 million, 247,709 replied and received an increase. We're just pausing there. You, I, I'm not forcing you to un, um, re re recollect the exact figures, but does that sound generally accurate to you, Mr Malcolm, those figures, the proportions of 78%? I, it's in line with the 70% that we talked about before, so that sounds reasonable. As a result of bank-initiated non-FCA CCLI invitations, net profit in the period from March 2011 to November 2014 was $23,062,422 from income of $39,974,790. Now, do you know if those figures are in the realm of being accurate for that period? Um, well, during the course of preparing for this, I did look at some of the documents that we, we produced for, for, the, um, for the notices for ASIC, um, and I believe there was one of their notices requested um, an estimation of the profit um, uh, from um, CLI invitations at the time. What I would say is, it's an estimation, it's not, it's very difficult to actually get an exact number from that because you'd have to make some assumptions around if a customer had a 50% utilisation rate and we gave them a credit limit increase and they increased their utilisation but it was still below the level of the original limit, how much of that additional usage was attributable to the CLI and how, how much was not and then how much additional other revenue that we got. So there were a number of assumptions made within that, um, but yes, there was an estimation made um, based on a sort of six months prior to the CLI being offered, then a six months afterwards to sort of make an estimate of how much profit we made from um, uh, those, um, those CLIs that were offered in that two and a half, three year period. So these figures have come from Westpac? They have we come from Westpac, yes. yes. They're very precise, aren't they? Yes. Uh, 
Now, this is obviously showing quite high profits. Is that another reason why Westpac decided not to act as early as it ought to have in relation to ASIC's guidance? Um, well, profit was, was one of the reasons why we, we did do limit increase programs, so yes. As, uh, WBC Westpac has told ASIC that for approximately 20% of customers receiving an invitation, approximately 480,000 invitations leading to 49,500 increases, their only account with Westpac is a credit card. Assuming these customers accounted for 20% of profits, profits from these customers would be approximately 4.6 million. Now, the first sentence, this is what we talked about earlier, that some of these customers only have a credit card with Westpac. That's, that's correct. Yes, I, I'm, again, I'm, I've only just seen this document. I know that there have been discussions with ASIC and we have made the estimate around the number of customers with only a, a, a credit card um, and, and that's the 20% number. I'm not sure that the 20% number applies directly to only the customers that receive non-FCA letters. So I, I have heard the 20% number before about credit card customers who would only have a, a credit card account. Um, so uh, um, I'm, I, I'll, I'll take it as an assumption, but I, I, I'm not verifying. Well, the numbers in here were supplied to ASIC by Westpac, is that right? Um, yes, we, we did. And you exactly. haven't sought to challenge the accuracy of those numbers in the statements you've made? No, but I haven't, haven't, I've only received this document now, so I haven't, haven't been able to verify any of that, that number there. But, I'll, uh, but you I'll, were given notice of it? I'll, I'll, we, I think we got this um, a, a day, two days ago. The, the figure of 20%. Yes. Um, just to be fair, Commissioner, the, um, it's not a subject that he was asked to address in his no. statement. But these um, are numbers from ASIC, aren't they, Mr. Uh, from Westpac, aren't they, so Mr. We, so we understand. Um, yes. They're, they're so numbers that ASIC have derived from numbers that have come from Westpac. Yes. Yes, thank yes. you. So the, yes, Mr. Dear. the figure Mr. of 20%, Mr. Malcolm, um, can you tell the Commission what you think, or if you know, what the percentage was for the non FCA customers? I, I don't know that percentage. Uh, I'll tender that. You give it 1.176, ASIC note 18 June 2015, ASIC 0010 0006 Uh, the next document I'll take you to, Mr Malcolm, is an, uh, an internal Westpac email. This is uh, WBC.300.023.2630. Uh, so this is an email from Alexandra Holcomb. Uh, do you know what her position is at Westpac? She's, She's the Chief Risk Officer. She's my boss. Uh, to David Watts. And what is his position? Um, at the time, David Watts would have been uh, General Manager, um, Regulatory Affairs and Governance. And so she's uh, forwarding this email below from Joshua Moore saying, have you signed off? That email below says, As Westpac has been in discussions with ASIC about our credit cards, credit limit increase process since mid-2014. ASIC has raised concerns about how we addressed responsible lending obligations. Since December 2014, we have placed our CLI arrangements on hold, and in March 2015, we implemented changes to our systems and application forms to reflect ASIC's preferred approach. Although their investigation is ongoing, we are now exploring with ASIC the basis for a possible negotiated outcome. And you set out some of those um, matters in your statement, is that correct, Mr Malcolm, the, the negotiated outcome? Yes. Uh, so what was the negotiated outcome in the end, Mr Malcolm? Um, we uh, agreed with ASIC to, um, uh, to um, take a cohort of the customers that had received a, a CLI um, from in the relevant period 
um, screen out from those uh, or include in those customers any customers that had been in arrears for more than 60 days, any customers that had um, suffered hardship in the 12 months after the CLI offer, and also customers that had been in arrears for two periods of 30 days in that period of time, um, and, um, uh, and conduct a, a remediation exercise where we would um, contact those customers ascertain the circumstances, their circumstances at the time of the CLI um, offer was, was approved and accepted. Um, and if they had been unemployed or had uh, reduced income at the time that they um, accepted the CLI, that we would make um, uh, uh, offer remediation of the amount of the CLI. I mean, it's in my statement, but that's a... Summary. Summary. Thank you. Uh, there's a memo attached to this email. I'm not sure if it will come up, but WBC.300.023.2634. Which sets out um, some of the recommendations that were being made around what would be negotiated. And under that uh, heading recommendations to approve the proposed process to identify potentially impacted recipients of a bank CLI invitation who subsequently faced financial difficulty and apply CLI special treatment and B to approve the proposed regulatory outcome involving a contribution to a worthy cause and you've essentially encapsulated some of that just then Mr Malcolm. Uh, I'll just take you to the last page of oh, the page zero sorry, 2634 underscore 0002. Thank you. Uh, just above that heading, regulatory outcome, uh, this approach was developed with regard to the following, uh, and that they're the, they're the details that you've mentioned there, that customers had received and it substantially contributed to their hardship. Is that what you were mentioning before, Mr Malcolm, when you summarised the process? Yes. Yes. And under regulatory outcome, our preferred approach is, seek to, is to seek to avoid an enforceable undertaking or infringement notice and seek to obtain ASIC's agreement for a contribution to a worthy cause together with a media release. I'll tender that document, Commissioner. With or without the email, Ms Dear? Uh, they're attached as one, I yeah. believe. Exhibit 1.177 1. <laughs> 1. will be email Holcomb to Watts, 14 September 15, WBC 300 together with associated memorandum WBC 300.023.2634. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so this remediation that, that you referred to in your statement, Mr Malcolm, uh, is it true Westpac's identified 6,612 customers as potentially impacted by the process that was adopted in 2012-2014? Yes, yes. yes. And of those people, you say that 3,397 have been provided with some form of remediation? Yes, that's right. And the remediations uh, varied between issuing refunds uh, to uh, credit card balance waivers, or, or both. Is that correct? Uh, generally, we would, the principle was to take them back to the situation that they were in prior to the CLI. So it would be a debt waiver of the amount of the CLI, or if they hadn't used all of the CLI, the amount that they had used, um, and, and uh, interest and fee um, reversal for um, the amount of interest that they'd paid on that CLI. Does Westpac undertake an assessment or go back and try and in hindsight to undertake the assessment of suitability again in accordance with what ASIC was telling it to do? Is that, does it undertake that assessment? Uh, in essence, in the remediation approach, the, the, the call to the customers would ask them the questions that we didn't ask them in the CLI. So we asked them what their employment status was at the time of the CLI 
and whether they um, had reduced income um, from the time of their application to the time that they received the CLI. Um, and, um, and so therefore, the two questions that would now be in, um, that we were now doing in, in CLI as, as per ASIC's letter of, of 2012, if they answered that they were not employed or their circumstances had changed or that they were on reduced income, they'd be eligible for the, for the treatment. And were they the only two questions or inquiries made? Were we there did, we did ask inquiries? a third question as to what were the circumstances of, of, of um, them applying for the CLI, but it was, I don't have the exact wording of those um, scripts. scripts, but um, but that was the, essentially the, there were three questions. But when you say the, the circumstances, do you understand that to mean their financial situation? Yes. yes. I see. Uh, and the total amount of remediation paid uh, is 11.3 million. Right? That's right. Okay. And that was only feb finalised in February this year, is that, is that right? The last payments were made or the last? Uh, yeah, it's in February 2017. 2017, sorry, yes. So we, we um, got approval from ASIC in December um, 2015 and we commenced the project in January 2016 and um, the, we'd made all the, the payments essentially by 20, February 2017. The project didn't close down until August 2017 because we did the, the assurance review. Why did it take so long to get that process completed of calling the, contacting the customers, 3,000 customers or more? Um, well, the approach that we took and we agreed um, with ASIC was that um, uh, we should have uh, an independent um, assurance process run alongside um, the remediation program and that we would start with a, a pilot of uh, roughly 600 customers um, and get the independent assurer to, to um, provide feedback that that was effective um, and that we were um, adhering to the, um, the, 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 the terms of the remediation. So that commenced relatively quickly. We then went back and made changes to the program um, in order to make it more effective, um, to improve some aspects of, of the call scripts that became ambiguous. Um, and then we rolled it out the, the full set of the program. The, the biggest issues we had in that program in terms of timing was actually getting in contact with customers. So um, whilst we would call them um, and we had a contact strategy, um, it's, if you've run any kind of program like this, it can be quite hard to, to, to contact customers and, and get them to respond. So I, in, in my view, um, it was a pretty, it actually ran reasonably quickly for a program of this type. Okay. Uh, does Westpac still send the credit limit increase offers to this day? Do you still send those sorts of invitations out? Uh, yes, we still do. But you're aware that from 1 July, you mentioned that, 2018, you'll no longer be la allowed to do that? That's right. Yes. And will you take steps to, will Westpac take steps to comply with those changes earlier than that date or will it wait until the very last minute to do that? Um, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not aware of what our, when we're, when we're going to cease the office. Okay. Well, you filed a supplementary statement, Mr Malcolm. Um, you originally asked in respect of your first statement to list incentives and key performance indicators that were relevant to Westpac staff during the relevant period um, in relation to initiation and acceptance of CLIs or credit limit increase offers. Um, I'll just take you to that statement. So it's uh, WBC 300. Oh, there it is. It's already there. Yeah. Or oh, 900, I should say. Okay. So you. You've attached to that some scorecards. I'll just take you to a couple of those if I could. Um, one is WBC 300-082-1251. Which, which tab is that for me, is it? Oh, I'm sorry, it's, it's the first, it's the very first scorecard, Mr Malcolm. So if you have that. Yes, that's it, and you can see it on the screen as well. Uh, so this is an actual scorecard for someone, is it? Their name's been redacted. Uh, yes. Yes. 
Okay. And uh, this person was given an annual rating of high achievement, is that right? Is that? Um, I, what I would say is these are people that didn't report to me. Um, they're in the product team. Um, so questions directly about what was in these scorecards, I can speak in general terms, but um, I can't say with, um, I can't say definitively what their final outcome was because the process um, has a, a, a page where the, the, the employee would rate their own scorecard and then the, the manager would put in what the, their ratings were. It would go through a subsequent process of alignment and then a final outcome. So this is, the, the request was for, was, was, were there KPIs in the scorecards? And there were some scorecards in the product team where CLIs were mentioned, but I don't have details of the outcomes for these, for these employees. Uh, but in any event, you can see that it says annual rating high achievement. Yes. So and is, do you know if that's the highest achievement that someone can get? Um, there's, it's a five point scale. Um, the highest is outstanding. Uh, the next is high achievement. The next is effective. The next is needs development. And then the, the, the last one is unacceptable. Okay, so this person's done quite well. Yes. Yes. Okay, uh, and then uh, where it says employee, that, that text there, is that what the employee has written about themselves? Yes. Yes. Okay, and then it is a, it's hard to find, but in the middle there, there's a number two. Identified opportunities to increase and improve the effective, effectiveness of our limit increase programs and CLI consents. Uh, further down, these included the adding of RMs and transactor segments to the targeted population introduced a holistic and always-on program for CLI consents capture across all channels and simplification of wordings across CLI consents capture. CLIs improved by 35% with consents improved by 65% uh, year on year, is that yes, correct? Right. Okay. And in the reference to RMs, do you know what that is in the first line? Um, I believe... I... My, actually, I don't know, so I'll say that. I can, if you want me to, I could guess, but. You can guess and we'll record it as a guess, Mr. Malcolm. I think it might mean um, relationship managers, which would be um, uh, segments of customers that are, are managed individually by, by rather than a sort of mass segment. I see. Uh, w now, would you agree that from what we're reading here is that this person has told whoever's assessing them that they've done well in this area, in boosting their CLI consents and um, capturing those consents. Would you agree with that? Yes. yes. That is valued by the organisation? Yes. And it's still valued by the organisation, is that correct? <coughs> well, it, it is until they're not allowed anymore. There are other scorecards, Mr Malcolm, but I think we'll, we'll leave it at that. They speak for themselves. Um, Commissioner, those are the questions that we have for Mr Malcolm. Yes, just before you, uh, I ask Mr Sheehan whether he has any questions of you, Mr Malcolm. Can I go back to rather more general questions than questions that are specific to the particular events that we've looked at? The bank's assessment of serviceability of a uh, credit card uh, arrangement uh, is an assessment that uh, at least embraces avoidance of default. Would you accept that? Yes. Indeed, serviceability is determined by reference to uh, analyses uh, that are framed uh, by reference to the minimum uh, necessary to avoid default. Is that right? And there are then add-ons on top of that or uh, variations to it. Uh, yes, and to avoid substantial hardship as well. Yes. What do you say, if anything, serviceability tells the bank about the suitability for the client 
of a revolving credit facility? Um, it, it says whether or not they can afford the minimum repayment amount um, and therefore have passed one of the key tests that they are they have an ability to, to repay this. Are there circumstances in which uh, different considerations would intrude when considering suitability, say, of a revolving credit facility of 5,000 compared with considering suitability of a revolving credit facility of 10,000? It would really depend on the customer's circumstances and what they wanted the, the, the credit card for and the features that they wanted within the credit card. So you, you, you start from a premise that a credit card is actually more than one product. It's both a payments product and a revolving line of credit. If a customer is wanting to borrow for a specific purpose and repay that over time, there are better products than a credit card. There are lower interest rates and you can make instalment payments. Yeah. Um, so the, 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 the premise that you, how do you pick which credit card is best for you is that you need to look at how you want to use that credit card. Do you want to use it simply as a payment mechanism um, and pay off the balance every month? Do you want to earn rewards for that spend? Or would you rather um, not earn rewards but have a low fee, long interest only period? Um, if you want to say, well, from time to time, I'll have a balance in, in that account, um, then you may want to go for, you would identify yourself effectively as a revolver to say, yes, I will have balances from time to time for bigger purchases that I want to do. Um, I'd rather go for a low rate card rather than a rewards card. So it's really at that point of origination. But during the period of time that you're using that card, you will change. I got my first credit card when I was a, a graduate, and I certainly use my credit card differently today than when I was uh, a 21-year-old um, just joining the workforce. Um, and over time, you will migrate to different types of cards, and you'll have different needs. And what we try to do is so when we do analyse your behaviour within those cards and we'll give you an opportunity to make, if you've made a larger purchase, to pay that off over, over a period of time. Or indeed, if we see that you're only making the minimum repayments each month, we can give you what's called a nudge and say, perhaps you want to look at a, a facility that you pay off over time at a lower rate. Does the bank, at initiation of the credit card account, uh, ask the customer any questions which are directed to those questions bearing on suitability that you've just described? Well, it, again, the way that we originate credit cards has also evolved over time. Again, when I, I joined the bank in 1988, you went to a branch, you met with someone, you filled in uh, an application form and three or four weeks later, you get an answer. Today, most people would apply for credit cards online and they're not actually speaking to a oh, banker. Yeah. And so they'll get information and we have tools on our website or through affiliate sites. If you go to finder.com.au, they'll have tools to say what sort of credit card suits, suits me and they'll look for the features and you answer some basic questions around what features you, you want and it will pick a card that is based on what you've told it as is a, a good card for you. And their decisions which the customer makes, not the bank makes. That, that's is that right. right. Yes. And they're not decisions that the bank makes at the point uh, of offering or agreeing uh, to a credit limit increase, are they? No. And I'm not picking out Westpac in this, at least to your knowledge within the industry, uh, no bank uh, asks these questions, do they? Not for a credit limit increase, but 
uh, we have other programs that will analyse the behaviour and the transactions in your account and um, make suggestions to you um, as to, to ways that you can optimise um, uh, your behaviour or get the right card. Yes. Yes, Ms. Diaz, anything arising out of that? No, no, Commissioner, no. Thank, thank you. you. Now, does anybody other than uh, uh, Westpac seek leave to cross-examine Mr. Malcolm? No, Mr. Sheehan? I have no re-examination, yes. sir. Might he be excused? Yes, Mr. Malcolm, thank you for your evidence. You're excused further attendance. Ms. Diaz. Yes, Commissioner, that concludes the um, evidence, or oral evidence, that will be heard today. There are a number of witness statements that Council wish to tender and the summons as well. Yes. No? Yes. So the first of those is the witness statement of Carol Seprovich, uh, dated 12 March 2018. And the document ID for that is WBC 9000100101. If we could hand up. I trust she will forgive me if I put the emphasis on the wrong syllable. Um, uh, S E P A R O V I C H. Spelling. Paravich. Paravich. Thank you. I mispronounced Exhibit it. Exhibit 1.178 will be uh, uh, the statement of Ms. Saparovich, 12 March 18, WBC 900 And there is a supplementary witness statement of. Ms. Saparovich, dated 22 March 2018, and that is WIT.0001.0015.0001. That will be Exhibit 1.179, further statement of Ms. Saparovich, 22 March 18, WIT.0001.0015.0001. Uh, Commissioner, just for good order's sake, I should give the original of that, I think, to our letter of Yes, thank you. Yes, for that. And is there a summons for... There is, Commissioner. There's a, that's the third uh, Saparovich document. There's a summons, which we will tender as well. Exhibit 1.180, summons to Ms Saparovich. Yes. Yes. Uh, a further witness statement uh, to be tendered... The witness statement of Gareth Robin William Russell, dated 22 March 2018, document ID CBA.0517.0022.0001. Yes. That will be that. Exhibit 1.181, statement of... Uh, Gareth Robin, William Russell, 22 March uh, 18, uh, CBA uh, 0517 There is a summons as well for that statement, Commissioner. Exhibit 1.182, summons to Mr Russell. Yes. Yes. Uh, two more, Commissioner. One is the witness statement of Alan... Saul Machette, dated 28 February 2018, uh, document ID CIT.9999.0001.0001. Exhibit 1.183, witness statement of Alan Saul Machette, dated 28 February 2018, CIT 9999000. Uh, sorry, double zero double what? Tri tri Start uh, triple again. Zero. CIT <laughs> double nine double nine double zero zero one double zero zero one. Thank you. Uh, and another, a supplementary statement of Mr. Machette, dated twenty two March twenty eighteen. CIT double nine double nine triple zero two triple zero one. Exhibit one point one eight four. Further statement of uh, uh, Mr. Marchette, dated 22 March 18, CIT 9999 0002 0001. Uh, and there is a summons 
that goes along with 1. that. 1.185 summons to Mr Marchette. Yes. Uh, Commissioner, at this point in time, uh, that concludes the, the evidence and council assisting will return uh, to deliver the closing address and we request we an indulgence. Until two. Uh, if, if that would be suitable for the Commissioner. Yes. Sorry. Can I just mention one thing? Yes, of course, Mr. You'll Chief. recall my uh, spectacular failure to be able to tender some documents the other day in the auto loan part of the case. Uh, the three documents in question, I think, are now on the system, but there remain some discussions between us and our learned friends about some redactions which we think will not be controversial uh, because they're consistent with previous orders. Um, what I was going to ask was whether the Commission was content for that the, the formal tender of that to be dealt with, uh, as it were, in chambers? I, th I think it's uh, satisfactory to deal with it in that way. Uh, Mr Sheehan, can you just indicate what the three documents are so that we'll have a link uh, within the transcript uh, to what they will be? I shall do that. The first is a, a letter from Westpac to ASIC dated uh, 12 July 2016 and its doc ID is WBC.104.003.2122. The second is a draft ASIC report entitled Car Loan Commissions and Consumer Credit Regulation. It is undated on its face but I think we will agree it was issued in 2013. And the third are uh, and has that got an ID on it? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, WBC.103.005.5591. And the third are uh, sovereign screen prints uh, relevant to uh, Mrs. Thiravanganam's loan. Uh, the doc ID is WBC.104.003.7572. And as far as a date goes, they commence on the 24th of July 2012. Now, when those uh, are in final form, they will become respectively exhibits. Uh, 1.186 will be the uh, letter uh, Westpac to ASIC. Exhibit 1.187 will become the draft ASIC report. Exhibit 1.188 will be uh, the uh, sovereign screen prints. Uh, and if uh, between the parties you can sort out this question of redactions and they can be uh, uh, taken and uploaded then. Thank you for that indulgence, Commissioner. Not at all, Mr Sheehan. Uh, 2 p.m. then. <laughs>